I'm here with my good friend, Freddie Boom Boom Rumbanis. How are you, buddy? Doing great, thank you. Hey, thanks for being here for Bass University TV. We're gonna be talking today about shallow water habitat because I happen to know you're a shallow water guru and that's what you really like to do. So we're, we're, gonna, we're gonna talk to you guys about the different types of shallow water habitat, finding a good target and, you, and talking about the tools that Fred and I would use to exploit that type of shallow water habitat uh, on this episode that we're shooting today. So right now, we're looking at some great shallow water habitat and uh, you know, what, what do you see here, Fred? You know, first of all, I noticed all the offshore grass. I see this grass has moved out of the water. <laughs> um, it's flooded. You know, obviously mm -hmm. the water's up a little bit and uh, you can also notice that the rocks behind it are real chunk rock. You can see leading out to that point, you've got a lot of chunk rock. So in my mind, I'm thinking it's a great habitat for bait fish and crawfish. Right. And now we've got some wind and breeze that's pushing it into that bank. Absolutely. Well, see, the wind is our friend. The wind and, is always your friend. Right. The only, I guess the only time the wind is not your friend is when you're in a scenario where uh, it muddies up the water. Right. And when the wind muddies up the water, that can be a negative. But hey, guys, make friends with the wind. I'm telling you right now, it, it adds a cover. It, it opens up the strike zone for fish. It pushes bait fish around. It's a great thing. So, so yeah, we've got, we've got opportunity for bait fish. Uh, to be here, uh, some good offshore uh, willow bushes or some type of bushes. Um, what, what do you see here as far as uh, lures? How, it, to me, how do you approach this? To me, honestly, this is a kind of a spot where you fish your strength. You okay. fish what you're confident in. Mm -hmm. Are you a jig fisherman? Are you a spinnerbait fisherman? Are you a crankbait fisherman? Because you can do all three things right here. Are you a swimbait fisherman? Are you a frog fisherman? Mm -hmm. You could do it all here. Absolutely. And um, really, the, the deal is, Whenever there's a breeze and you break up the surface, it makes fish more vulnerable in clear water. We've got really clean water right here. So when that, when that breeze kind of breaks up that surface, you can start getting those top water bites. You can also get a swim bait going, you know, a weedless swim bait, preferably, something mm -hmm. that you could throw and track into right. that grass. Um, and also something you can flip, some kind of a creature bait, which mm -hmm. I can flip. In my mind, when you get out towards that point, you get into more chunk rock. And I'm looking at that, but before I get there, I see this tree and I'm thinking, let's flip this real quick. Right. Let's go ahead and drop something down there. Let's work all different edges. If you'd like to throw a square bill, mm -hmm. you do the same thing. But get out to that rock, pick up a biffle bug. Some kind of a swing head deal mm -hmm. to mimic the crawfish. Because I'm thinking those chunk rock, it's a great opportunity for bass to use to look for a crawfish. Mm -hmm. And so that biffle bug really mimics a crawfish very well. Gotcha. Well, I love these trees, right? And this, this, this bushy stuff that's in the water. And one of the things you really want to, you know, look at when you're trying to identify a target in shallow water is when the different types of habitat come together. And we've got this standing timber here and off in the distance behind you that's intersecting this bushy uh, habitat, right? So we've got two types of habitat that come together. I want you guys to, to really um, take notice of that when you have things come together like that. That creates an ambush point for a predator, uh, creates a feeding opportunity, and it's it's different. It's different. And a lot of times and, if you get mixed vegetation, mm -hmm. you can see lily pads mixed with some milfoil, yep. that intersection of both of them, that's yep. where you want to be. That's where the fish can, the bait fish can really hide, but also yeah. the big fish can use as ambush. Exactly. And that's what we see here. We see two types coming together, and we see the bushes intersecting the rocks off in the distance. So we've got a lot of uh, different types of habitat coming together and when we when you see that you know that's going to be a great target and um and like you fred you know you want to you want to fish your strengths uh whenever you get the chance to uh we're we're here in the summertime and it's warm season so uh, it just about anything goes you know when the water temperature is this warm you know any, anything from a spinnerbait to a crankbait to a flipping pattern um, you know, are excellent tools when this water temperature is real high. Uh, one, of the, one of the most consistent tools that you can use that, that I really love to use, especially when, uh, when I'm struggling to catch fish in this type of habitat is... A Welcome to the Bass main, University TV, an online video training, training course where you learn... Type of box. Don't have a water temperature that controls it. Don't have a time of year. 
The only thing separating you and a jig and being a great jig fisherman is yourself, how you look at it. How many people here think and have made the comment that, Joe, I just don't think I'm, I'm, I'm fishing my jig right. How many guys ever say, I just don't, I'm not sure if I, get, I know when I get a bite. You can raise your hand. This ain't an alcohol and almonds, man. You can raise your hand. <laughs> I've been to them. No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> I did take my uncle one. I was telling you else like that. <laughs> you know, the way, the way you jig fish and, and people wondering if I'm getting a bite, we're going to try to clarify some of that today. Throwing a jig is no different than throwing a worm. That's all it is. The best part about a jig is you really ain't got to wait to set the hook. People's like, when you set the hook? When you feel tick, 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 or thunk. He don't have pockets. He don't have a safe deposit box. He don't have armpits. He don't have a catcher's mitt. When your line jumps, there's only one place he's got it. He's either got it sitting on it or he's in his mouth and both of them are real in the same. Blister him. When you're with a jig, when you feel that initial bite, you ain't got a reel down. You don't have to do all that. You set the hook. When you're jig fishing and your you're, you're frame of mind's got to be a little different. It really does. We're going to simplify that. Period. We're going to change it up. I got two rods I throw it on most time. It's a quantum seven foot four and a seven six. I flip with a seven six medium heavy. I cast my jig most of the time with a seven four medium heavy. That's skipping docks, rocks, anything gets in the way, bicycles, wash machines. It's two rods. The line choice is real simple. If it's super clear and I'm on fish deep, I throw 16 pound sun line shooter. That's for my small jig. If I'm flipping, I'm gonna do 20 or 22 if it's a big jig. But I'm gonna stay somewhere around 18 to 20 pound line always. People sometimes wonder when you're fishing docks and shallow cover, Gerald, can they see the line? No, fluorocarbon does not reflect sunlight. Question is, the gentleman asked me, do I tie a polymer or not on fluorocarbon? Absolutely not. And I will show you guys, I tie a knot, I don't know what you call it. I learned it on the farm hauling hay. We'll call it the double shin dough. I don't know. I double my line, twist it up, run it through the loop, takes about two seconds. I have three tag ends. What this does is it doubles the line everywhere it touches. So when you pull it down, I have it burn it. I went to the Berkeley plant back years ago when I was with them. They had the guy in the little white trench coat that they do, the little lab. He's got all his machines and he's got all his little knots. And he said, would you like to try your knot against mine? And I'm like, well, absolutely. I'm a redneck. I'm like, sure. It's like tying trucks together. Sure, tie them up. So he ties his and his breaks at like 98.7, 98.8. I tied mine, I broke it 99.4 and 99.5. So I said, you keep working in your lab coat and I'm gonna keep bailing hay. Bait I throw 90% of the time is a 3 8 ounce ball head jig. They'll be made this year by a company called Buckeye out of South Carolina. The jig's gonna be called Balling Out. I've had this jig made for about three years by myself. Wasn't for sale and I have worked on this jig. It ain't something that I said, Man, if you put my name on that, you give me $11 a pair of house slippers. No, this is a bait that I went out and built and I won money with over and over and over and kind of kept it to myself. Then a company come to me and said, can we make the jig you want? I said, only if you make it exactly like I had it. The Weed Guards Design Pacific sits right down on the hook. Don't have no way to show you that. God, that guy looks a lot like me. You can see how close the Weed Guard is. See, you don't need a PowerPoint when you got this. That guy's gonna lose that fish if he keeps jerking around with him up there. You can see that, the weed guard sitting right down on top of the hook. You don't want a weed guard on any jig. I don't care who makes it. Hey everybody, welcome to Bass University Live. Um, we got a great show in store for you guys tonight. Uh, I'm really excited about it. We, there's so much going on in the world of fishing right now. Uh, and fishing is lighting up in my neck of the woods. It is on fire. Just got off the upper Chesapeake today. And we'll be talking about, you know, how we're catching them down there and how you can catch those fish, those spawning fish when you can't see them what, like what I'm doing down there right now. But um, in studio, uh, we're psyched to have John Hunter with us. <laughs> Appreciate you being here, man. Yeah, thanks. I'm really looking forward to joining you guys tonight and talking about some fishing yeah talking fishing we're, we're either fishing or we're talking about fishing <laughs> that's how we roll Thank but you. uh john you, man you just came off a, a beautiful 11th place finish down at kentucky lake congratulations i appreciate it yeah it's uh i always say when you can finish 
in the top 20 against mm-hmm. that caliber of fishermen, that group out there. Yep. I mean, man, that's doing something, and I'm always going to go home smiling. Yeah, no doubt. Well, you crushed them down there. And um, and we're going to be talking about that. We're going to be talking about Kentucky Lake for all you guys out in that part of the country. Uh, the FLW tournament just took place down there. And, uh, of course, John did great, but there's some controversy there. Um, the leader of the tournament. That didn't take long. Stepped off the playing field. So we're, we're going to be. <laughs> right to it, huh, Pete? Right to it. Well, just letting people know what we're going to be talking about tonight. So you don't, you don't want to miss that. I know there's going to be some opinions on it, and I certainly have mine. And, um, you know, we've got that going on. And the winner of the Bassmaster Elite down on Lake Travis uh, in Texas, Drew Benton, is going to be with us via Skype or calling? Via Skype. Via Skype. Yep, yep. Awesome. Uh, so we're going to be talking to Drew. Man, what a big win. Um, so young in his career to, to be able to get a win like that. That's that's really going to juice him. Oh, yeah, absolutely. Yeah, Drew's a great guy. I was super, super happy for him to see that and uh, looking forward to getting him on here and hearing hearing how he did it. Yeah, I mean, a lot of pressure. You got all those guys chasing you down. Uh, Jacob Wheeler just crushing them, just putting all the pressure on that he could. And, uh, you know, so many neat things happening down there and uh, trying to get, the, you know, the one. and we'll talk about it with him, is the, it's a lake that's absolutely full of fish. Hat, and some of you guys may have lakes like that that you fish where you got tons and tons of little fish how do you get those bigger fish out of those groups yeah I, that, that like you know I, I got to keep up with it a little bit we obviously mm. had our tournament going on but uh, I remember when the FLW tour went there two or three years ago it was the same deal it's just like I feel like it's almost like there's this giant gap in between it's like they miss yeah. three spawns all the time you just got 12 inch or 12 inch and then bam somebody catches a 7 to 8 pounder and it seemed like you had to have <laughs> one or two of those good bites to be right there in the top yeah so. and uh and some of those guys managed 20 pound bags down there uh yeah. which was amazing targeting like ray hansel i mean we watched him I, I watched him on bass uh bassmaster live watched him just target big fish just refuse mm-hmm. to go fill his limit <laughs> and just keep chunking that giant spoon and those big you know wake baits to uh you know keep targeting yeah. those big fish takes a tremendous amount of discipline to fish that way yeah absolutely i don't i i don't know but it was it was sight it, it was a it was a great uh event to watch i really enjoyed it going to be looking forward to talking to drew um about all that but uh hey i want to thank everybody for joining us tonight we got a lot going on we got a lot of giveaways uh so you want to hang in there you want to participate in that um here's the first one uh all you guys watching us on facebook if you like and share this live feed, we're going to put you in a contest to enter a $1 million prize pack of b Well Baits. That's right. <laughs> One, One million. One million. <laughs> <laughs> that, that's, that's my personal estimation. That may not be factual. Yeah, that's some good stuff in there. But look, look at all this. This is. Uh, yeah. Tell us a little bit about what's in there, John. Man, this is uh, pretty much a full assortment of everything b Well makes and their soft plastics. This is something that's... Uh, it, it, it really a lot of people don't know about it but man they make some awesome stuff they got a venom tail worm some uh you know soft jerk baits it's called their scorpio and then they've got uh they've got some prisms which is basically you know uh, a stick soft plastic stick bait and uh they've got a lot of ribs in them which tend to give it a lot more action and displaces a little bit more water than your typical stick bait and they got some of my personal favorites in here uh the armor crawl which is an awesome jig trailer and and a just a regular flipping bait the tails have some air po- or they have air pockets in the tails which allow them to stand up great for bed fishing flipping anything and uh the swim bait the deuce that's a killer swim bait just to put on uh put on a jig head the tail gunner uh man they got it all in here so it's a Heck of a giveaway. Man, it, it, <laughs> it's pretty awesome. I'm not sure it's quite a million dollars, but it's a it's a monster giveaway pack, guys. So all you got to do, go to the Facebook live feed, like it, share it, and we're gonna pick one of you guys to win this this great gift, which E will mail out immediately, FedEx overnight, guaranteed. <laughs> Righty? E? Promising a lot. <laughs> <laughs> we'll get it to you as soon as we can. But uh, the um. So we got that going on, um, and that's just uh, that, 
Well, John's here, so I'm going to talk about the our big prize next is we're going to be giving away John's signature series of uh, cashing rod built yeah. specifically for jerk baits. Yeah, well, for jerk baits, yes, and uh, right here it is a uh, it's a seven foot uh, fast medium action rod. Uh, so with this bait, we call it the hunter rod, um, and not. It is, yeah, that hunter is my last name, but it's more for baits than hunt. It's for, uh, you know, jerk baits, uh, smaller crank baits, you know, those up to 10 foot divers, uh, smaller swim baits, um, little jigs, you're hopping around, even lighter swim. I mean, man, anything that you're hunting for a reaction bite, mm -hmm. uh, baits and hunt, man, that, that's what it's for. And uh, this is a rod awesome. that has been a staple in all my big finishes the past couple of years. So, outstanding. Killer rod. I'm, I'm super excited about it. Uh, yeah, well, we're lucky tonight. We'll give yeah, one, we're going to be for free. We're going to be <laughs> giving that away at the end of the show, BTC, to the I am. Um, It'll be a trivia question. It, oh, trivia question. Uh, so all you guys, uh, I want to invite you to go over to Bashu TV. All subscribers, of course, I know you guys know you've been here for with us for a while, and we love you guys. Uh, if you're not a subscriber to Bashu TV, try it for free for 10 days. Use the code TRYBU. So come on over and join. But by joining, what you'll be able to do is you'll be able to IM us with any of your questions, and you'll be able to enter all these contests with all these giveaways that we're going to have. So you go over to Bashu.tv. Um, right there you can subscribe. Use the code TRYBU. And you're yeah, in. You sign you're up in. for free for 10 days. Sign up for free for 10 days. That's right. And ask us questions. We want to invite all you guys watching. New guys. Guys been with us a long time. Uh, we're here. We're going to be talking about a lot of great topics. John is a jerkbait guy, and we're going to be talking about that tonight. So you guys that uh, have some questions about that, want to dive into that a little deeper, um, you know, let's talk about that. We're going to have Drew on here in a little while. Any questions that you guys want to talk about, um, you know our board's open so we want to hear from you guys and and when drew's on we've uh to celebrate his win we've also got five knocker bees from bagley's that we're giving away tonight and they'll they'll be based off of uh questions coming from the viewers on the mes message board best question wins the prize so bring them bring them guys <laughs> questions are good that's right we, we love to hear from you guys and it, that was awesome watching that tournament um it's not that often you get to see Topwater decide a major event, you yeah, know. It really isn't, and uh, man, that's a that's a fun way to watch guys catch them. Unfortunately, I wasn't like I said, I wasn't able to to get to watch a lot of the videos. But on the pl on the travel here today, you, you, I was catching up, watching some of the fish catches, and you, it's a, you were busy. It was uh, your excuse. It's a it's an exciting way to yeah. watch guys catch them, and uh, mm -hmm. man, that that's got to be a fun way to win a tournament. I, I, you know, Brian, I, I don't know. I know we were both watching. Um, it was an awesome weekend to watch TV. It was raining. It was miserable. And there were two amazing tournaments going on simultaneously. I'm going. I'm jumping back and forth between FLW Live and, and Bassmaster Live. And I'm watching guys on one deal, you know, smashing topwater fish, you know, catching giants out there in Texas. And then on the other channel, I see a guy ledge fishing, jacking thirty pound stringers. I mean, it was uh, and it was in the tournament by forty pounds or something, <laughs> twenty eight pounds. I, I, I he's he. I think it was a thirty pound difference between yeah. thirty and change between first and second 28. place. Yeah. Twenty eight. Twenty eight. Yeah. Twenty eight. Yeah. Twenty eight. Yeah. Now they broke my record. I have eighteen pounds on the Hudson River. Do you? Yep. That should be a trivia question. Pete Glusick. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> well, I didn't have to fish the last the, day on yeah, the Hudson. Yeah. Not, to, not to pat myself on the back, right. but I'm going to pat myself on yeah. the back. <laughs> I did not have to compete on the final day of the tournament, and I still would have won the tournament. That's wow. every fisherman's dream. <laughs> to be able to do the classic yep. pizza at the dock. That's and, right. Uh, That's right. Yeah, Lambert got to do it. So. Yeah, he did get yeah. to do it. He yeah. came back in early and was just hanging around the, uh, the marina site. They had dominoes. He did, he, did he? Did he actually, actually he do actually it? Actually, had dominoes. Oh, I got he pulled. Did. I got pulled away. I didn't get to see that. Yep, he got dominoes. See, what did you eat? <laughs> What's that? What was your celebration meal? Man, I I didn't celebrate. I I didn't realize that I had it won. I because I was jacking them on the last day. I thought everybody else was too. Oh. So I only had a seven pound lead going into the last day. That's a good lead. And um, so I I did I I didn't 
I, as a matter of fact, I made it in with just a few minutes to spare. Yeah, late as always. <laughs> just like tonight. <laughs> I've never been late. That's the one place I'm never late. I don't know why. <laughs> you should start charging me pounds, and uh, <laughs> yeah, 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 I'll be able to get here on time. That's but right. um, well, it, anyway, it's an ama- amazing set of tournaments. Uh, great coverage all around. And um, but you were fishing on Kentucky Lake. You were fishing in this in this derby, and um, boy, as heavy as the weights were. It didn't, you know, all the guys said that it was a lot tougher than what the weights were showing out. Man, it really was. And, uh, you know, Kentucky Lake is in a, it's in a weird place right now. Um, not to say it's in really bad shape because there's still a lot of big fish in there. They didn't just disappear, but, um, locating them now with this, with this carp issue is, uh, it, it, it's changing the fishery. Mm-hmm. We'll just put it that way. Um, and it's not, it's not going to be as easy. The Kentucky Lake of old where you just, idle over and just see these massive schools of fish and um they just light up on on your graph like like you know there they are lined up perfectly along the bottom and it's just it, it i don't know that it's going to be like that um so we're we're just as fishermen we're going to have to adapt and uh and hopefully the commercial fishermen out there can get a little bit better grip on on eliminating these these carp yeah i, I mean it, it... We heard it on the Bassmasters tournament that was there just a couple weeks before you guys, and um, and then we heard it again at Kentucky Lake. The you know they're trying to get the co- uh, commercial fishermen motivated by getting them some funding to make it more valuable to fish for these Asian carp, which are you know totally um, you know infested uh, the lakes on the Tennessee River chain. They've moved all over, and um, but you know hopefully we can get that done. We want to bring awareness to it. If you're not aware of it. You know, we want we want you guys to look into this issue, and and we we want to help those guys uh, along those lines. I mean, they're in the they're in the Great Lakes. They're in or they're trying to get in the Great Lakes. They're, we need to do something to try to control. It's motivating the commercial fishermen is the direction that they want to go. Uh, so we want to try to help them do that. But uh, I was watching the show, which was fascinating to me. It was listening to the guys talking about. Um, separating the asian carp from bass being able to try to distinguish them yep. on their sonar that, that's a that's a trick right there it, it is and a lot of guys say you know when they see the carp they just don't even they don't even fish um but sometimes this week i would see him and i would i didn't get a lot of bites offshore like I, we'll talk about it later but i caught them i caught them different every day um you know but one thing i think that's happening is the carp seem to want to be right where the bass like to be right there on the brakes um you know right when it starts to fall off where those harder spots are that's where the carp want to be and i think it's there's so many carp it's crowding out the bass and uh they don't really have a place to be so i think that's Mm. the big issue is is just the crowding out like they're they're almost just taking up too much space wow well you know it's fascinating listening to you talking about it because it the question in my mind is why are they in the same space the the carp are filter feeders i guess they must be feeding off the shell beds like most bait fish do mm-hmm. and I the shell so, yeah. yeah the shell beds must be putting off all that nutrients into the water the carp are mm-hmm. filtering it so the bass are there because all the you know all the bait fish are feeding off the same shell beds so they're trying to eat those bait fish absolutely yeah. and that uh, like i said there's just, it, the sheer number of those carp and mm-hmm. that's what's, what's killing the bass. They they just feel like they got they're either going to slide up or you know a lot of times what I saw a lot of those fish are getting deeper um, and hanging off those breaks. So. Gotcha. Well, that's interesting. Well, it, back now we're at Kentucky Lake. You're competing in this tournament, man. You took a run at it. Yeah. Uh, how, what what were your patterns out there? How how things look for you, man? Going into this week, I I honestly had no idea how I was going to catch them and. Uh, if you read some things and listened to some guys interviews that was that was a you know that was a pretty consistent you know report from everyone uh i went back and forth shallow deep shallow deep every day and every day in practice and i just i still couldn't get a grip on which which one was better you know you catch one or two out deep run up and get a good bite shallow so i just went into the first tournament day with an open open mind i'm gonna i'm gonna do both and uh, i thought i was gonna fish more shallow i was like i'm getting bit consistently there's still some water in the bushes there's some there's some brim beds starting to pop up with some brim on them still a lot of bait fish but the water was consistently getting warmer so i'm like man i 
that's gonna discourage them being up there. It went from like in the mid seventies to the mid eighties in just the few days we were there. Right. Um, the shallow, shallower bays. Uh, so, so that's got to, you know, that's got to be the developing pattern is moving fish out, uh, right? So, th those yeah. fish in the shallows are got, you know, that's what we're talking about. It, Every day that goes by, there's fewer and fewer of them up on the bank. And that's what you don't. And that's what I kept wanting to not. That's why I didn't want to fish shallow because that's something you don't want to do practicing for a tournament is practice a, a a pattern that's going away you want to find the developing pattern you want to be practicing where they're going you want to intersect them that's how you mm -hmm. win tournaments and and that's why the guys who were first second and third uh they were all out deep you know right, they, right. They, they were fishing the developing pattern fishing where the fish were going um i just i just couldn't you know couldn't get on it really consistently day one i thought i thought i was going to catch them shallow but i ended up weighing i think every fish in that i caught deep Mm -hmm. um, so day two, I thought that was going to happen. I was super excited about it. So, right, I'm going to go catch them deep. I didn't catch a single bass deep. And at noon, I didn't have one. I had zero. And I had to pull into a pocket and uh, just had the right timing and caught all my weight and an hour up shallow in bushes. So, <laughs> uh, and then day three was totally different. I caught them on a jerk bait uh, on the lower end of the lake. So it was just a just Real slopping it around yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> that's well so the the well we saw wesley strader win shallow yep right so that's you know and that was just a couple weeks before your tournament so there were still some fish hanging around there well your yours a, yours was a flipping yeah, pattern flip, shallow yep flipping bushes and okay you know six inches but we had almost a foot foot and a half less water than when the elite series was there mm -hmm. um so but there was still some water on them. those fish just weren't right in the bushes and positioned on the structure they were kind of beside them or just in front of them uh, they still wanted to be up there but uh yeah there theirs was definitely a full-blown shallow fest uh the water was still in the 60s the shad spawn was in full swing um our first day of the tournament we our first day of practice there was still a strong shad spawn i went in some marinas and you could just see shad fall on your bait but i did it every morning and every morning by the third morning of practice i didn't see one shad fall on my spinner wow bait. Like i was like this is over yeah yeah, yeah. they, they had ending. that full full blown there so. right right well they they had stable conditions too wesley was talking to us about how water levels were dropping but the last few days of the tournament is stabilized and that allowed his flipping bite to mm -hmm. hold up. And uh, for those of you that aren't familiar with these water level changes, uh, as the water level falls, the flipping bite typically goes away. Yeah. You know? Yeah, those fish don't like it when, you know, they're living on on that wood and that structure. And when they feel that water coming down, uh, that makes them very uncomfortable. Wants mm -hmm. them to, makes them want to slide out and, uh, and get off that stuff. Absolutely. E, we got an IM question? Yeah, so, John, you mentioned that jerkbait pattern you were yep. running on day three. A couple questions on that from people. First off the bat, is that a suspending jerkbait or a slow-sinking jerkbait? Yeah, suspending jerkbait. Um, so, you know, we, we had the right conditions for it. It was a little bit windy that third day. It was sunny. Um, it had those fish looking up, wanting to feed up in the water column. Um, so I just kind of rolled with it. I, I had had a bad morning every morning and hadn't had a fish that I weighed in until 11 o'clock each day. So I Ooh, said, man, that's I, pressure. I'm going to do something way different today. Mm -hmm. Um, and I just picked up, a picked up a jerk bait and, uh, it's just something I like to do and I'm comfortable with. And, and, uh, I caught a limit pretty dang quick that morning. And so I was able to relax and just, uh, I did go up shallow and catch one that I weighed in. Uh, the final where, where were you jerking on Kentucky Lake? Off a ledge or off a no, point? No, just where? Any, verti any vertical structure, you know, like steeper points, uh, okay. any kind of uh, current break, like a riprap point, you know, the barge canals, anywhere um, that served as a current break for those fish because they were actually pulling like 60,000 that, that day too, which really Ooh. helped the jerk yeah. bait by really positioning those fish on those seams and in the right places where they yeah. were easy to access and catch move no Correct yeah you're not you i catch. wasn't graphing schools Got and catching you. them i'm just i'm just running running and gunning and throwing it at, at places that that i think they're they're living another interesting one that came up are you ever throwing a dress treble on your jerk bait a what a dress treble hook no 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 I, I i have just a standard treble hook system that i mean we can go over it now or we can talk about it in a little bit that go, I, go uh, with it man go for it yeah so the, the treble hooks that I use, I actually have them down here. I'll grab them. 
Great questions, by the way, guys. Keep them coming. And um, I know uh, just to interject on the dress treble hooks, a lot of times uh, I do like to use them when I'm around smallmouth. Sometimes, man, it can it can just make those smallmouth commit to a bait. Um, but most of the time I don't use them. But that is one situation where if I, especially if I get fish that are swiping at it, short striking it, I will put one of those flashes on there on the treble hook, and sometimes it, it really helps them commit. So. Uh the system that I've I've experimented a lot, and a lot of people complain. One thing about a jerk bait that that really uh, turns people away from is how many fish you lose. And uh, ever since I've gone, I did a lot of testing and a lot of experiment. And ever since I've gone to the system, I mean, you still lose some just because it's it is in the nature of it. But the hookup, the landing ratio is just. I mean, I would say it's 85, 90 percent, which is really good with a, that with is a jerk bait and it is amazing you've got nine hooks on that bait <laughs> and somehow they find their way off of that sucker it is and the the hooks that i've gone to is the gamagatsu g finesse they're the tournament grade nano finesse hooks uh i use a size five and six so what i'll do is i'll go with a size a size five on the front and the back and then i'll go with a six in the middle uh the reason I mix I mix and match them is it's all about weight. Yeah, and every jerk bait's different. So if I, I want it to spin perfectly, but that generally I'm, I use, I throw a six cents provoke one oh six, and on this jerk bait in particular, those that that weights it perfectly to keep it a suspending jerk bait. Now, in the winter time or when it's colder and the water density is different, and you know I want it to sink some maybe uh, the water is colder. Then I'll, I might go with a, some fours, but generally across the board, if I want it to be a spinning jerk bait, which is what I want when I'm jerking in the spring, summer months, pretty much most of the year, I'm, I'm using the the two fives and a six. Um, that's just been what I've used, and it's man, it, it really works, and it's a big secret of mine. So I'm yeah. sharing it with you all. <laughs> we appreciate it. But uh, that's uh, do that, and I think you're. Uh, landing ratio is going to skyrocket well that's a that's so the big one's in the middle and how does that affect uh does that affect the performance of the bait no, at all no it keeps it, it it really does it keeps it you you know you don't want it to sit depending on how it you're, you're jerking it it's going to sit different but you do want it to sit mm -hmm. you know pretty you know pretty parallel in the water um and that just i, I do like the bigger hook on the back so a lot of times when fish get post spawn and, and get real funky and and moody a lot of times they're coming up and just nipping the back of your bait and uh, that little bit bigger hook hanging off the back is uh it's nice and and i like the bigger one on the front because the bigger you they seem to never get the front hook you're right right mm -hmm. so if, if that little bit when you lock them in when you do get them on the front hook it's usually for sure game over like you're right. gonna boat that fish so i like the bigger one there and uh the, the, this one always naturally hangs down a little smaller so i just put the smaller one excellent yeah and we're using the hunter cash and rod to fish it. Yep, ten ten pound floor uh, P line fluorocarbon. Ten is, pound is what I usually use, unless like in Florida or something. If I have a, a certain depth, like if the grass is a certain depth, and I'm trying to keep it above it, I'll go with a heavier line to keep or, it shallow. Or, or the Chesapeake. Or the Chesapeake tomorrow. Yeah, Which I'll probably we're, go fifteen we're, or something. Yeah, like that. that's well, we're gonna see this in action tomorrow for uh, for all of you subscribers. Uh, we're gonna be going out and doing some uh, jerk bait. Um, on water training tomorrow that's going to be available on bash university tv real soon yeah to stay on the jerk bait topic a little bit more i like this question because i think it's something that trips up a lot of us that don't necessarily throw it this time of year what's the dirtiest water you're going to throw a jerk bait in do you ever pull up to a spot and just say that's way too dirty to throw a jerk bait or is that never really the case if you have a foot of visibility you can catch them on a jerk bait i mean sometimes 10 inches uh, if you if you look uh, last year Elite Series, we were at uh, Ross Barnett, mm -hmm. and Dustin Connell did win swimming a jig up in the river around just blown in mats and whatnot, but a lot of people forget, like, second and fourth place was Jonathan Van Dam and Kevin Van Dam, and they were throwing a jerk bait and lily pad stems mm -hmm. with, like, less than a foot of visibility, so don't don't get discouraged. It's a, it's a bait that can catch them any time of the year in any watercolor in any condition yeah that's this is, here's the thing on watercolor and we talk about i i run into this all the time because i fish a natural body of water right so it's immediately affected by rain events mm -hmm. it'll go from clear to mud and back again in in no time 
Uh, but the, I hope this helps you guys because it helps me a lot every day. Is I got I I determine whether or not the water is getting muddier or it's getting clearer. That's huge to me in the fishing. Like if it was, you know, if it was no visibility yesterday, and now I've got six inches of visibility, a lot of baits suddenly come into play. You know, whereas if it was gin clear yesterday, and now you've got two inches of visibility, it's going to take away a lot of those patterns like jerk bait fishing and, and several others. So it's important to know what that water was looking like yesterday uh, before you make your choice on whether that water's muddy enough to fish baits like this. But, um, all right, so we're using, um, we got our hunter rod, we got 10 pound P line, we've got our hook scenarios down. Um, and I see, I remember this from uh, last time we were talking is you, we, I wanted to talk about cadence, you know, yeah. how you trigger in those strikes. What, what, what are, what are the different cadences you use? I, I say it every time I talk about cadence, cause that, that is the most popular, uh, jerk bait question in the world. What's cadence? Yeah. And, and I, it's really funny you asked me this. Cause when I had my Marshall day three, Kentucky Lake, when I caught him, on a jerk bait, I, that was my same Marshall from Harris Chain when I caught him jerking. And he's like, "Man, it's just crazy. You don't have a cadence." And I'm like, "Yeah, that's that's it exactly. The best cadence is no cadence. Um, the wild, like bait fish in the wild, don't swim at a certain. They don't go. And they don't stop, go, go jerk, go jerk, stop. pause. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> they, they, it, it's unpredictable, and that's what a fish wants to see. Right. Like, you might you might have a two second, three second pause, and then just jerk it." five or six like i just i don't have a cadence now i'm not saying you don't need to not listen to the fish i mean you definitely need to listen to them if they if they're wanting to pause and mix in some more pauses but i'm not saying that you jerk it twice and let it pause for 10 seconds but mix in six jerks let it pause for four seconds and then eight seconds just just be very very erratic and unpredictable with it right and that's great advice, you know, because I unfortunately I'm an engineer and I have to do two jerks and a pause every time, or or I I can't sleep at night. But uh, but the, <laughs> the the erratic retrieve, you know, it's it's, it's definitely key, um, you know, in triggering those strikes. What do you got, E? Here's a good question: Why would you throw a hard jerk bait over a soft jerk bait necessarily? When do you choose between the two? It's a great question. Yeah, yeah absolutely. I. You know, a soft jerk bait definitely has its its place. It, you know, the floating worm, it, you could consider that some a sort of a jerk bait. A fluke, um, th those kinds of uh, baits have have their place. They're good in the spring when the fish are are spawning and they're they're acting kind of goofy. But um, I, honestly, I I always just opt for a hard a hard jerk bait's better when when there's wind. When there's uh you know when there's more turbulent uh conditions those when it's high skies high sun that's when the the soft jerk bait's gonna shine um but but that but i can't say that that doesn't catch them in those conditions too a hard jerk bait but typically um wind and wind you go hard bait and then if it's high sun you know that's when your soft jerk baits are gonna play and and grass too uh yeah. you know there's a lot of times when the grass is just it's too high it's too peaked out uh and that happens a lot in the spring and a lot of the lakes yep. and that's where the soft jerk bait because you can fish it weedless mm -hmm. uh is and you can skip it that. under trees and you can skip it under trees yes <laughs> how, how, how do you how are you at skipping hard jerk baits i'm not very good <laughs> no that usually doesn't work out. no it, doesn't. it ends with me swapping a new reel out <laughs> <Yes>. <laughs> or smashing them into the dock yeah or whatever it is you're, you're trying to yep. skip but um all right well jerk baits obviously catch big fish uh they catch numbers of fish if you had to pick the best conditions uh, to fish a jerk bait, what would it be? Wind and sun, no wind. So <clears throat> it's it's really funny, you know. You go up north, you go to Champlain, you go to Oneida, you go to a lake like that. You want wind and maybe just a little bit of wind, just a little ripple and high sun. That that's what you want. All right. And and when it's slick calm, that's when like it's really good too, because the fish they can see really the smallmouth can see really well. They're looking up. They're looking for, for mm -hmm. stuff above them, and however, I, I feel like when when you're fishing for largemouth down down south, the, the cloud maybe just a little you know, a little bit more cloud cover and and hot and, and winds. Right. What you gotta have for sure. Right. Right. So up north, it's like 
little bit less wind, more sun. Down south, it's wind and just a little bit of clouds. Got uh, that. That's perfect yeah. conditions in my book. Because sometimes when it gets real bright and sunny and calm, in in the largemouth habitat, it, you know that they won't you know, react to it. Right? right. It's a little bit too aggressive. You can't get them to bite it sometimes. And largemouth seem to be a lot more sensitive to pressure and how they feed. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, the barometric pressure people talk about, so people roll their eyes at it, but it's a real thing when it comes to, to largemouth. Smallmouth, I don't think they're near as affected Mm-mm. by it. They're sight feeders. They're aggressive. They love um, the sunshine. Yep, they love the sunshine, and when you get it near them, they're going to bite it. So the sunnier it is, the more they can see, the bigger your strike zone is. That's why I think the sun's great when you're fishing for smallmouth and largemouth. Um, it, it no, I just like to be a little bit cloudy. I want some, I don't want it to be dark, but uh, you know a little bit more yep. more clouds. All right, we got good we got good jerk bait conditions. We got our our five and our six number sixes on our bait. We're rigged. We got our hunter rod. We're ready to go. We're get we're hooked up. Do you got any tips on uh, the best way to land fish? I mean, are, is, are you power hook setting? Are you sweep hook setting? How, how are you How are you landing these fish? Yeah, I mean. When you get a, a lot of times when you get a bite on a jerk bait, you know if it's winter time and you are having a few more pauses in there, you'll actually see your line. But when it get when the water gets in the heck, it was in the 80s last week. I didn't feel a lot of the bites. I'm jerk jerk. My pauses are like a second at most. Okay. So when I'm jerking and when I'm going to jerk, I feel them. And you really just lean into the fish. You're not you're not slack lining them and trying to, you know pull their brains out you know you're you're working with treble hooks you lean into them these things are extremely sharp they're gonna hook them and uh the the first thing i do when i hook a big fish is uh i usually have my thumb right on the button of my casting reel i do not trust drag on reels with jerk baits a lot of times you have them skin hooked and if you rely on the drag on the reel you're gonna lose them because it it, there's just too much pressure on it's gonna pull the hook right out so second the second I hook a big one, I hit my button, and I let my thumb do do all the work for, for the drag. Right. Well, it's it, it's hard to catch them. Um, quick story: I lost a twenty thousand dollar fish on a jerk bait. Oh, um, that hurts. <laughs> it was in a Bassmaster tournament, and uh, it was down on Lake Toho. And uh, in, in the turn, the last day of the tournament, I was kind of struggling. I had some small fish in the boat, and and I was uh, I needed some help to to get back up well into the checks and uh and i got it uh, a gi- absolute giant grabbed uh, my jerk bait and she grabbed it what I year s- this was this is 20 years ago so what jerk bait it, this was <laughs> this was a, a floating rapala of some sort <laughs> i'm curious what you were throwing <laughs> yeah just a piece of wood whittled out is it <laughs> <laughs> sorry i carved it from pine right. that that morning I got you. Uh, but it, but she jumped and she had it T boned right the way you want it sideways front hook back hook middle everything's hooked and jumps completely out of the water and I'm like oh man this is it it's I don't know if it's a ten pound fish but it was in the ballpark you yeah. know what I mean it's a good one that would have done would have made a lot of money for me that and I but the next you know she fights she's digging I got her out off the grass line. She comes up and jumps again. This time, she's got these back two hooked in. Still pretty good. Still pretty good. Still yep. pretty good. I'm still, I'm yep. still all right. <laughs> she comes and runs under the boat. I, I turn her, and now it's oh, over. No, it's over. I got her. I got uh, her coming. You know, I didn't. I didn't. I don't think I was. Yeah. I mean, she ran, and I yeah, let her go, her and coming, and what? she got. She was done, and I had her coming. Uh-huh. I had her coming, and she comes up like out of my reach. And got the back treble hook in the corner of her mouth with her mouth shut like that, and I'm and I'm up here and no nets right, so she's coming right to me, and a foot from my hand, she pops open her mouth, just does that, and the jerk bait goes, Too! and she's there, but yeah. she's beat like she thinks she's caught, yeah, right, but she's and she's coming towards me, and I reached out. And the only handle I had on her was behind the gill plate. Well, I can do about a four and a half pounder behind the gill plate. Yeah. I can just lock it and got her. 
I I had her, uh, but I had my hands weren't big enough because I, I you know it was a big giant fish and I had her and she slipped out of my hands oh. and I watched her tail swim away, oh, twenty thousand dollars gone. But uh, I didn't I didn't hands. have the five six combination. Had I had that for yeah. sure. It'll that still break your heart. I, the yep. five, I mean, it's not 100%. I lost <laughs> one at the Harris chain that would have won me $100,000 mm-hmm. this year. Oh. You know, it, it happens. It, it's just part of the nature. You're going to lose some, but if you get enough bites, yep. you'll land 85% of them and be in good shape. Yep, there you go. Well, it's a great topic of, of jerkbait fishing, guys. I want to invite you guys, watch it on Facebook, like it, share it. We're giving away a whole pile of b baits. Uh, we're going to be picking somebody from Facebook to win those those prizes. We're going to give away some six cents provoked jerk baits in there too. Outstanding! All right. Yeah, yeah. Woo. Bonus. Yep. Now we might be at a million dollars. Yeah, we're getting there. Just jacked it up. All <laughs> right. Hey, um, what 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 determines uh, the size jerk bait you're throwing? Whether you're throwing a you know yeah, a small a two hook jerk bait or three and a half four inch jerk bait. Yep. I don't throw the small ones hard, hardly ever. I That's because you don't live in the Jersey. Three hook ones, but the difference between the <laughs> You know, the regular one or the 106, the, the deep, which is the extended bill, you get, get more like that six to eight foot range. This is more of the two to five range. Um, in the early spring, or it all depends on the depth you're fishing. Like yeah. the clear lakes, you know, if you're fishing, like a lot of times just when we go fish for spotted bass or deeper reservoirs, smallmouth, you'll go for the, the, the deeper jerk bait and try and get it down there a little deeper. Those fish are hanging suspended maybe over – over 15 to 20 foot of water you're going to want that deeper bill get it down there closer to them so that they can they can see it and feel it and come up there and eat it mm-hmm. do you ever use a silent jerk bait um no i don't i i, I okay i haven't i mean if they're if they're if they're pressured enough to where i have to use a silent jerk bait i'm going home it's gonna lose <laughs> <laughs> i hear you <laughs> We go to a soft plastic jerk bait at that yeah. at that moment, or just trailer the boat, <laughs> <Yep>. <laughs> or just trailer the boat. But uh, for all you guys, great questions, great questions. We really like them, uh, and we're going to be picking a lot of you guys to win prizes. We're going to be giving away some Bagley's one knockers. We're going to be giving away uh, the Hunter Cash and Rod uh, at the end of the show on our trivia question. What do you got? Um, I don't know if we covered this already. Floating versus slow sinking versus suspending. That was not asked. Well, then that is a winner. That, yep. th- that, that is a good that question. That guy gets that. that you want to tackle bait. that, John? Sure. Yeah, you, you can help. If you want. I'll, I'll, so I'll jump in. The floating, uh, your typical, you know, your old school Rapala floating. That's right. That, that, the that, original floating. Yep, you know. that shines in the spot. I mean, mm-hmm. in my opinion, you know, when they're up shallow, just cruising. When you got cruising fish, you got fish on beds, you got fish just coming off, fry garters. Mm-hmm. That, that, when you're fishing very shallow, they... That that's just where it, grass lakes mm-hmm. really shit when you're fishing it really shallow those floating floating jerk baits everybody's first like, jerk bait fish is on the Rapala floating, floating one that gotta be <laughs> gotta be but those those seem to seem to shine that that mm. time of the year um, mm. it's something about that you know th- those fish see that see that bait and they see it leaving them and uh, mm-hmm. that just causes them to to react and take it uh, suspending is uh, you know more full pre-spawn post-spawn um kind of deal and then the sinking's more definitely more winter time when you have those mm-hmm. colder water temperatures the fish are a lot more lethargic they need it to be right in front of them yeah more, more so they're they're not as willing to come up for a bait that's when you need that sinking jerk all right the bait's coming they're coming up and the bait's coming to them yep and uh yeah the the cold water or falling water temperatures mm-hmm. you know that time of year uh is uh well it's a great answer to the question it's a great question who 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 do you have the guy who asked that question <laughs> ta hog snatching i like it i like it great question uh and we'll be shooting you some prizes um ta hog snatching so uh you know we talked about um me losing a big fish and losing some money uh i think it might be time to jump into it bry what do you think Somebody gave up a whole pile of money by going home from this recent oh, FLW tournament. Uh, oh, <laughs> what's that? <laughs> there it is. <laughs> <laughs> the um, you know, and 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 the reason why I want to talk about it is, you know, I mean, there's a lot of controversy here, but what it comes down to, uh, 
for me in, in thinking about this is you know there's two sides of every story and he's gotten a, a lot of abuse um for leaving a tournament site for those of you that don't know what we're talking about um there were two guys leading first and second at the flw tournament and um the um, they wound up trying to start on the same spot one um his name was hayes decided to uh you know he was frustrated with the scenario and left the tournament uh went home never you know and just left the yep. entire tournament site uh lambert who was the other went on to completely dominate the tournament uh, and win it. And at the time, Hayes was leading the tournament. Yeah, it went from a uh, two-horse race to, to, yeah, to a one-horse, but just a blowout. On a Everyone sil- else crashed and burned. <laughs> yep, giving it to him on a, on a silver platter. Yep. So, um, But what it, what it comes down to is etiquette, you know, or, or something that I want to talk about because a lot of people watching watching our program, they're tournament guys, and, I, and we get this question a lot like about etiquette, like um, how far, how close can I get to somebody before – you know, it becomes a offensive situation, and you know what rights do I have on a particular spot in, in any tournament? But um, I don't know. So some of the thoughts that I got on this is, you know, from what I've what I've seen and read is Hayes was starting on this particular spot for two days, first two days of the tournament, and really winning the tournament at, helped by that area. And uh, Lambert. Um, on the third day had a better boat draw or whatever or faster boat and was able to get to that spot before him and start there um question is does hayes have the right i mean old school when i first started you know if you're winning the tournament you get a little bit of courtesy right in that scenario well the so the version that i have a bit different version than i've heard you probably have a better version uh, than me i just know what i've read so what i've heard and I think this is the way it happened. I could be wrong, so okay. don't don't quote me. Don't you know? Don't point to me if it's wrong. But we're the, we're gonna hold you to the letter of the law. <laughs> the version that I heard was um, Lambert started there day one mm-hmm. and caught whatever they he had, I think he had twenty four pounds. He okay. started there at twenty four pounds, caught him quick, left it. Haynes pulled in there ten eleven o'clock. Nobody was on it. He didn't know Lambert was there. He rolls in, catches 26 and a half pounds off it, and then leaves. They both come in. Neither of them knew that either of them had fished it. They both weigh in 25, 24 and 26 pounds. Mm-hmm. They're both leading the tournament by a long shot. Well, day two comes around, and Haynes, Lambert goes and hits a couple other places. Haynes starts on it. Lambert comes by. They said he came by and checked it two or three times. Haynes was on it. And, every time and didn't fish it and never fished so lambert and i know this this has to be somewhat true because i was fishing down south around paris and didn't see any flotilla of boats but they too i'm down there and i see like 20 boats pass by me that's somebody you know yeah that's one of the two guys well lambert didn't fish the spot went down south ran 40 miles to a backup spot caught 19 pounds off it they both weigh in 19 something that day and they're both right there. I think Haynes has maybe a three-pound lead on. Mm-hmm. Well, day three comes. Haynes is in first. Lambert's in second. Okay. Well, okay. they go out. Lambert has a little bit faster boat and passes them there, beats them there by three or four minutes, and starts fishing there. Um, so, you know, I, in my opinion, I, if that's the way the real story is, then I think, personally, I think that Lambert had every right to pass and go fish it. Mm-hmm. And I think Haynes had every reason to come in and fish right beside right. I mean, really, I think they both had a right to the spot. And uh, the best thing to do would have probably have been just line up and fish it together. And I saw them do that. They they did for a little bit. And uh, obviously, Haynes, Randy, uh, it didn't make it. He wasn't he comfortable. He got frustrated. He yeah. frustrated. He wasn't comfortable. And uh, he decided to go home. Right, right. <laughs> and then... And- you know, in that scenario, as you as you said it, you know, because we have to make some assumptions. We weren't there. We didn't see all this stuff. But, uh, you know, like back in the day, we used to, you know, if a guy was leading the tournament, you'd give him, you'd give him courtesy to the area unless yep. you were in contention. Right. And then that, you know, you, you have to continue to compete. Mm-hmm. Um, and it's a four-day tournament for a reason. It's it, you. That's <laughs> why your boat yep. won one day. 
and your boat 100 the next day Absolutely. so that you get a shot to to pick your starting point um you know and and i see that as as a frustrate and here here's the message that you know that you know i take from this um and i try to make it a learning experience learning experience for all of our guys is you got to communicate um you got if that situation happens uh you know the best scenario is to jump in right you know and and start a, opening a line of dialogue with the other angler mm-hmm. because a lot of times you know it's frustrating because man your adrenaline's pumping you're leading yep. the tournament you got a chance to win and all this is going on and you you can you can lose focus uh but by getting some dialogue going a lot of times you can work it out a lot of times you can say like if lambert had the bet he was there first he had the best lineup and i mean i've seen guys fish where okay well i get one fish then you get the lineup i get one fish then you get the lineup yeah. You know where they they agree to work together. Yeah, and I've been in that situation. I've been in this, both situations. I've been in situations where you pull up and you know it's it's fighting. It's butting heads. There. Say his name, Pete. <laughs> there's no win scenario. Um, then there's other situations where you know if you can just communicate and uh, a lot of times you can just stave off any of these problems. So you know that that that's something that you know I, I want to you know put you know recommend that everybody does put yourself in that situation communication is definitely key um i tell you the sport's getting a little bit of a bad rap because a lot of the guys that are i hear this all the time that the new you hear it from the old guys in particular mm-hmm. you know that the new guys you know they don't follow the rules you know they just cut you off they'll they'll do this do that and i don't know that that's necessarily yeah, yeah true. But you've been around is that true because I, I think a lot of it's got to be tempered with the fact that there's now live coverage. Yeah. I think that goes for everything, you know, through, throughout the news. I, I think our perspectives have, been, have changed because of the 24-hour news cycle. Same thing with coverage. Coverage wasn't there. Mm-hmm. There were run-ins on the water all the time back in the day. Absolutely. The only people that knew about it were the guys competing in the event yep. involved in the, in, the, in the run-ins. Right. So has it changed? You know, I'm going to tell you, no, I don't think it has changed. I, I don't think it's young guys. So that, can people please stop crying? Oh, there's no sportsmanship today. I, I think it's an oh, individual. So well, I'm I tell you right now, there there are a group of people out there competing that don't have sportsmanship. There are guys out there that will cut your throat and leave you on the road bleeding. I think there always have been. They, and there always have been. They always have been there. And there's, there's guys that are always going to be that way. They're... Um, you know, and, and, but as a as an angler, you've got to learn how to compete. You can't, I mean, lay, laying down and leak and handing over a hundred thousand dollars to that to Lambert. I mean, I, I understand everybody's different. Everybody's got a different perspective. But man, I I I wouldn't have done that. I couldn't have done that. Right. You know, I don't necessarily. And I'm not gonna hate on him for it. Yeah, I know I couldn't have done that. Yeah, but it's kind of intriguing. That he had enough self awareness to say, if I stay in this situation, it's going to go bad. Right. It's going to get ugly. I'm going to make a mess of it. I'm going to make a mess of myself. I think that's where he was. And he yeah. said, I just got to go mm-hmm. because I'm about to red line. Right. It, it, that's good. That's a good perspective. Self awareness, and I got to yeah. get out of here. Uh-huh. Right. Yeah. And that that would explain, you know, what what happened there. And uh, Man, I just know, stayed right there in red line. The only guy, yeah, <laughs> and it would have been bad. <laughs> you know, you know, you know, Ike would have red line, but Ike would, Ike is okay. He's the only guy I ever met that can red line, and then he's perfectly normal five <laughs> seconds later. I red line, and I, it takes me a month and a half to recover. Right, I got to get some medical treatment. For the rest and, of the day. <laughs> <laughs> What's that? In the fetal position, the rest of the day. Exactly, the rest <laughs> of the month. <laughs> you, know, you know, so I, I, I like Hayes. I, you know, he might, he like, he might be that exact situation he saw the red line coming he yeah. knows he knew it was a bad situation he was know pissed thyself. and he was trying to send a message he was trying to send a message to the fishing community that hey wake up you know we got to show each other a little bit of respect a little bit of sportsmanship um and maybe you know maybe that that certainly was the message he was trying to send in my opinion or or that's what i see from yeah. it i know as know? an observer i never met the man so i'm not gonna talk bad about him Mm-hmm. You know, I mean, who knows what was going on outside of fishing too? Maybe that was just like the last straw. I Maybe think they've like, got no, all right, enough is enough. I'm done with this. I'd be doing a million yeah. other things right now. You I know? think I think they've got a history. So right, 
And it's tough to fish like that, man. It's no yeah. fun. I mean, when you're pulling under spot, you're battling each other for for the spots, and um, you've got to have these arguments and debates. And Ish Monroe wants to get in your boat and push <laughs> you in the water. You know, I mean, <laughs> this is <laughs> it's tough to compete <laughs> out there sometimes. But, uh, you know, I can appreciate it. But, uh, you know, I think there are, you know, some rules. that I, I think in your description of it, if that's the way it went down, Lambert had a right to be there. And it, that honestly, it sucks. It sucks that the competitor, the only guy that could beat you in that tournament, has a right to fish the spot that you're leading the tournament on. I, I know it sucks, but, you know, that, that, that guy has that right. Yeah. And it's, uh, yeah. I mean, those two dudes know more about Kentucky Lake. Mm-hmm. They've, they've forgotten more about Kentucky Lake <laughs> than I'll ever know. I mean, yep. they, it's just crazy that it just boiled down to one yep. one place. You just feel like both of them could have gone ten different other places and maybe caught a bass or two. So. Yep. Well, speaking of uh, jerk baits, he was using a soft plastic jerk bait. He was, yep. Um, yep. Do you know much about what he was using? I mean, yep. I, I heard some brief stuff. I, I was able to see it five sec- or in a split second as yep. he was casting it. That's really been a bait that's been around and people have been using for for years and mm. someone will like he that's the bait he used what was it, like three years ago he had 100 pounds in a costa event on kentucky lake it's the exact bait he was using and it gets some buzz and then people just seem to forget about it but it's definitely a staple out there on the ledges it's a it's a giant it's like a seven or eight inch soft plastic jerk bait um Castaic makes it it's called a jerky j mm-hmm. and uh he puts it on like a one ounce or one one and a quarter ounce uh uh, scrounger, scrounger head, scrounger yeah. Head, yep, and he throws it out there, and you can watch the replays of him, and he just makes sure you can tell he keeps clicking his button to make sure that that thing's staying just down, just way down there, and a little bit off the bottom. Because those scrounger heads, they have a tendency to want to, they're like like a blade, and they have a tendency mm-hmm. to want to rise when you reel them. So you can see them; he's just barely creeping it every now and then. He'll click his button yep. and make sure it's down there. And a lot of times, when he when he click that button, let it go down. When that bait looks like it's killing, mm-hmm. that's when he would get a bite. Right, right. Well, the, he had one really cool um, uh, series Lambert did where uh, he had a bite, and he, you know he set on the fish and loaded up and missed it, and just as you're describing, click the button, boom, let it right back down there, clicked, clicked, boom, and triggered that fish into biting. Yep, yep. those fish. Uh, a lot of times they'll come up they, when they're feeding on prey. They'll come up and hit it. Yeah. And they're trying to kill it. And uh, sometimes mm-hmm. they won't just eat it. They'll come up and 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 ram it. And uh, a lot of times, if you just kind of kill your bait, it'll uh, yep trigger them to go ahead and eat it. Right. They've done their job. Yeah. <laughs> well, it was amazing to see uh, Lambert uh, thirty pounds, close to thirty pounds on the last day. Wins by thirty pounds, twenty. I don't know what he won by a pile. And, uh, you know, that was amazing, catching another 100 pounds on Kentucky Lake. and uh call him the ledge. In. The ledge. The le- <laughs> <laughs> that's, that's a good one. Yeah. The legend. And, um, you know, he won that uh, event on a developing pattern. I miss Rebecca coming in for a quick visit. Um, oh, oh. <laughs> Becky Iconella poking in. <laughs> the, um, uh, but he won it on a developing pattern. Um, which was uh, what we talk about a lot. We talked about it already, mm-hmm. right? Ledge fishing. Uh, these, this is a post-spawn summertime deal. This is where, uh, when they get done spawn, this is where they're going to. Mm-hmm. And although, obviously, it wasn't that easy, right? There wasn't that many of these ledges that were producing. No, it really wasn't. And, and Lambert even said it on live. I mean, I know the spot that he ended up catching eight and the, the nine pounder and a lot of his weight the last mm-hmm. day it's a i mean it's known it's a big community hole yeah. but the problem was in practice they they weren't there he said he didn't even see him he idled it the second day of the tournament and that's when he saw him there so just sticking with it even in the tournament is mm-hmm. what is what paid off for him and uh and that's the reason those guys you know found a lot of these places is because they stuck to it whereas a lot of guys like me and a ton of the other field even a lot of the other ledge hammers um, they were fishing out deep, fishing out deep, and they, like, oh, you know, I'm not catching them very yeah. well. So they would run shallow, and I think every time you go shallow, you're 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 wasting that valuable time that you may have been able to find that one spot that, mm-hmm. that had a few. And then every day as the tournament progressed, more and more were showing up because those things get That's out it. there a lot quicker than people think. I mean, yeah, oh, hey, they, they, uh, it's amazing. I've out, seen it on Lake Ufala. 
they're they're up on the banks and then all of a sudden they tell each other yeah the baits out on the ledges yeah. and and the banks just evacuate and all the fish are on the ledges mm -hmm. kentucky lake's the same way and and you said the bait and i know we already talked about the carp and i don't want to go back there but i am going to say that that's one of the big reasons that the bass fishing is suffering is because the shad population is has been decimated on Kentucky Lake. Right. And uh, the carp are do pay. Uh, they are they are the reason for that. They're, mm -hmm. they're feeding on the the plankton, which which is what the which is which, eggs, which, which is what the shad yeah. feed on. Yeah. So it's kill. They're kill. They're eating what the shad eat. So mm -hmm. it's, it's so that's what we're not okay. seeing on these ledges now. They like, used to be able to idle over and see piles of bait. Mm -hmm. Not anymore. You, you don't see that. Um, which is that's that's why it's killing that. Right killing that that bite and killing them. hopefully the yeah. bass can figure out how to eat these asian carp <laughs> or i'll they, be they, throwing they, big carp yeah. swim <laughs> they gross it the next big great idea they grow so darn fast uh that that makes it hard to eat are we going to take a break let's take a break pete all right we're going to take a break i want to i want to mention a couple things before we do we go the official jump starter of the bass university i have my we go right now jump starting my iphone uh which it can do that too has emergency lighting this little baby right here uh, will jump start your boat, uh, which is amazing. You gotta have it. I don't care if you're a, a tournament bass angler like me, or you're taking your family out. When you need that outboard to start, you need it to start. And, and look how small that thing is. Th look how small it fits I mean, anywhere. It's if, amazing. It fits that in Pete's tiny hands. Butt. Save my butt at Norman, mm -hmm. and the bass opened two weeks ago. I was out there, my uh, completely dead. I tried jumper cables on all my other batteries, nothing. And my buddy pulls up and he pitches me that. And I said, that thing, yeah, there's gonna, no, yeah, there's I've no tried way. everything. It's not going to work. And he's <laughs> like, I promise. I'm like, not going to work. I'm wasting. I was like, give it to me. And I put it on there, cracked right up. Nice. Way in, didn't have to have, you oh, know, wow. worry about anything. It's, yep. That thing's killer. Well, we go saved another one. Um, and there's a Wego 66. I carry this Wego 44 in my truck. And I carry the Wego 66 in my boat. And it's just a little bit bigger, but it has a, a little bit more power, and it will save you. It will save your tournament day. It'll save, could save your life by getting your you and your family in safe. So, we goes the official jump starter of the Bass University. Uh, we are also uh, brought to you by Poptical Sunglasses. Uh, what's the code, Brian? You can get a I discount. Think you need to put those on real quick. Yes. I want to see them on. Well, I am Pete Luzak, bitches. Yes. <laughs> Pete, good. Pete you got the, the, the cheat sheet with the code on it, bro. I got the cheat sheet with the code. I'm yep. going to try to find it here in a second. If I can't find it here real quick, I'll, I'll give it back to you. But Popticals are amazing optics. They, uh, they, You always need to be wearing them. In particular, I had an incident the other day, Bri, where... Um, there it is right there. Did I pass through it? An incident the other day where... where out on the Chesapeake, we're blind fishing for uh, spawning fish, and you know how they bite, right? They're going to grab an appendage oh, yeah. at first, and they'll run it off their nest. And and uh, I had one of my uh, customers with me, and as the fish ran off, I sweep set the hook, and it hit him in the eye. Oh, my Fortunately, goodness. it didn't do any serious damage, but we weren't wearing at It was low-light conditions, but this, this light lens is perfect for low-light conditions. You, you need to be wearing your eye protection. For, for impact, popticals is great for that, as well as... Uh, the polarization which is going to help you be able to see a little bit deeper into the water but the really cool part about popticals is they are able to fold up into a really small compact package you put that in your pocket in your case in your pocket so you're not going to lose them you're not going to forget them um, check out poptical sunglasses and you can get a uh, great discount ba on Poptical Sunglasses by... Bass U50. Bass U50. $50 Say, off a pair of Popticals. Say $50. Um, so Dang. check that out, Poptical Sunglasses. All you guys that are watching us on YouTube and Facebook, uh, don't forget on Facebook, share it, like it. We're going to enter you in a contest where a bunch, bunch of great stuff, win a bunch of great stuff. Uh, go over to Bass U, subscribe. Try it for 10 days free using the code TRYBU. Come over, check it out. We've got over 400 instructional videos. We're going to be building a couple with John DeMar about jerk baits. We're going to be Woo. seeing it on the water in action. He's going to show be showing us how to do that. That's the kind of stuff we have on Bash University TV. Uh, they're full-length instructional seminars that are designed to help guys 
be able to watch them and go out and duplicate that, that, that technique. That's key. So check it out. We've got over 400 instructional seminars over there. Try BU. Try it for 10 days. And you get access to all this great stuff like the Rapala VIP discount, which is just like a pro staff discount. Yep. Uh, great discounts on all Rapala stuff, including uh, Terminator stuff, including VMC stuff. Um, and all they, that great they stuff. frog. Ex what is that? They frog. What do you say? I didn't hear it. I didn't hear it either. <laughs> it didn't sound like English. <laughs> Come on over to Bass University TV, guys. Check it out. We're going to take a quick break. We're going to have Drew Benton, the yes. champ, the winner of the elite tournament down on Lake Travis. He's going to be coming up right next. We'll be able to ask him questions, talk to him. So stay with us. I'm Pete Luzak, Bass U TV. Luzek, Bass University TV, and I want to talk to you about the importance of good optics when you're bass fishing. And I, I don't care whether it's during the spawn when we're trying to see the fish visually, or any time of year that we're fishing in the shallows uh, where we want to see the habitat, or even in the deep water where we can see things like fish chasing our baits, we can see them following them, uh, identify the species. The, the ability to be able to get good depth penetration through the water is just paramount as a bass fisherman. I mean, it just helps you become a better angler. And I, I'm gonna just give you some simple choices that I use to pick my glasses that, you know, for the various conditions. And you can see right now on a day like today, um, you know, it's overcast, it's uh, low light conditions. We've got a little bit of breeze. These make looking through the water very very difficult so i'm using a, a, a lens i like a brown lens uh, or even an amber lens uh, to be able to see through the water a little bit better in these low light conditions uh, these are popticals glasses excellent nylon lens which has incredible visibility which i believe really lets me see a little bit deeper into the water so you got to try to check these guys out but in these conditions I'm going to use this, uh, this brown lens, which is going to give me a little bit more visibility. Now, in situations when the sun's out, I'm going to go with a different lens choice altogether because this is going to give me a little bit more protection and it's going to help me in those real bright conditions. And I'm going to use a reflective dark lens, a gray lens that's going to help me get a lot more visibility and, or a lot more protection and is a lot better in the really, really bright light conditions. Now in these conditions, I like the brown lens a lot better. It's gonna give me a lot more visibility, but in the bright lights, of course, I'm gonna choose these popticals. But here's what I'm gonna be looking for, like I alluded to before, is I'm always going to be looking for targets. I'm gonna be trying to identify stumps that are ahead of the boat, blow down trees, grass edges. I see so many guys go fishing in the shallows and they don't wear their polarized glasses because it's low light conditions, it's early in the morning, what have you, but you're missing so many opportunities. You definitely want to have them on all the time. And when the fish are spawning, it's, uh, it's, it's obviously a critical component because they're going to show themselves to you. You're, and you're going to see things that let you know that the spawn is, is taking place. And, and what I call that is like springtime activity. When I get in the backs of these pockets, I'm using my glasses to see stuff like bluegills suspended high up in the water column, carp suspended high up in the water column. And on a really good sunny day, you'll see, in the early season, you'll see those big bass come and suspend high up in the water column. You can, you want to look for things like tails. Uh, the bass has a very distinct black marking on his tail and you want to look for that. A lot of times I'll be around blow down trees, docks, and I can't see the whole fish, but I might just be able to see a piece of his tail. And you see that distinctive black line down it, you know it's a bass, and in the springtime, you know, that's, that's an awesome little feature. So you want to you wanna always wear your glasses. Uh, they're certainly going to protect your eyes. We spend so much time in the sun, and that's so very important. What else I like about these popticles is they give me protection from the wind when I'm driving the boat. They really block the wind nicely. And uh, 
when you're running these boats from place to place, that's, that's such an asset. But always wear them, always wear them, no matter what time of year it is, spring, summer, fall, protection of your eyes. But most importantly, as a fisherman, to be able to see the habitat, to be able to see the types of fish you're targeting. So make sure you've got a good pair of optics. I use pop, popticals, and uh, you can find out more about them at thebassuniversity.com. But I'm out here on the water for Bass University TV. I'm Pete Kluzak. Hey, everybody. Welcome back to Bass University Live. Uh, we've got a lot going on tonight. Uh, great piece talking about Kentucky Lake with, uh, with John Hunter here. If you guys are just joining me, John Hunter, um, fresh off the FLW Tour, 11th place finish. Um, and we're going upcoming. We've got Drew Benton, winner of the Bassmaster Elite on Travis Lake. He's going to be coming right up. Um, and I just I want to invite everybody also to go over to the BassU.TV or the Bat and or the BassUniversity.com. I'm not sure which, but either one of those. I think it's BassU.TV. Uh, Ten dollar Lucky Tackle Box has offered a great deal for all of the guys subscribers of BassU TV. Ten dollars off their first tackle box. So go over there to get your code and get yourself $10 off Lucky Tackle Box, any one of those tackle boxes. So we appreciate it, guys. Appreciate you guys being with us. And um, Drew Benton is winner at Travis Lake, and uh, we're going to be getting him on, on the horn here in just a minute. Um, Bryce, so you let me know when we're ready. Yep. But um, did you fish that tournament, that FLW on Ken or, uh, Kentucky Lake, uh, Lake Travis? Travis, I didn't know. That yeah. was... Uh my first year on the elite series so okay i wasn't on flw okay yeah well i was there and um i fished it um and it was in drought scenario and um it, i you know i've been around to see some drought situations but this was crazy and now i'm from the north right so i'm used to cold weather mm -hmm. the coldest tournament i ever fished was lake travis really i think it was a february event uh -huh. and they had a cold arctic blast that just came down. It was like an ice storm or something right before, wasn't it? I don't remember the ice storm. I remember the bitter cold. Um, and what the deal was, it, it was crazy. Like, we're launching on tournament day. And uh, now the lake's down like 50 feet. And on if you guys have never seen these, uh, these flood control lakes or these water um, supply lakes, right, they have to fluctuate. So they build the launch ramps. They're like... 150 yards long mm -hmm. you know the launch ramps because at some points the lake's gonna be real low and you got to back all the way down it and other times the lake's at full pull so at this time it's low so you gotta you gotta back down 45 degrees for like a mile and a half to get to the water it's crazy and it's a little scary you know because you gotta keep it straight gotta keep it on the yeah. ramp you know and um you know so we're launching and it's freezing i mean 20s or upper teens it's like it's super super cold and what's happening is the guys are coming in because the water's warmer right it's texas so the water's not gonna freeze right it won't the water temperature won't get that low but the guys are launching in and then they're coming out and uh, it's uh, it's freezing on the ramp so as they drive up and, and the whole ramp this ramp that's like hundreds of yards long is like an ice rink so as you're backing down mm. You get about halfway down that ramp, and all of a sudden you start sliding. Yeah, it's and you got your whole rig, and you try to press the brakes, and you're and you're jackknife sliding and sliding, and the only time you can get traction is when the wheels hit the water. Yeah, just make sure your boat's unhooked. Yeah, <laughs> <laughs> but, pull you right in with it. Yep, that's right. So you, but when you hit that, when you get through the water surface, and then you can get some traction, and mm -hmm. and uh, <laughs> but it, but we uh. We had that going on down there. It was the coldest ever. It, I was late. Everybody was late. But get this. I launched my boat. I was so late. I ran down, jumped in my boat, and I, I failed to start it before, when I launched it. So I jumped in it, started it, and put the throttle down and blew my power head. Oh, uh, cold seas. Yes. Yeah. Cold seas. So learn a lesson, guys. In extreme cold weather, just crank your outboard, let it idle for five, five minutes, minutes yeah. and you'll be good to go. But I fished on the trolling motor. So many fish on Lake Travis did. I was able to catch a limited fish on my trolling motor, but uh, but I see somebody has joined us. Uh, the champ, 
He's got a, he got a big win uh, this this weekend down there at Lake Travis. It wasn't that cold for you as it was for me the time I fished it. But uh, Drew Benton's with us. Congratulations, buddy. Thanks for being here. Thanks for having me, guys. I I appreciate you making time to uh, to get to come here with us. And Brian, right now I'm looking for my headset because I can't hear. Him. Oh, oh yeah. yeah, there you go, Pete. <laughs> <laughs> we're, we're, we're highly technical over here at the Bass University, man. <laughs> <laughs> we got you now, brother. But uh, man, congratulations! Uh, you know that that was a huge win. It's a career maker. H has it sunk in yet? Man, no, not really. And to be honest with you, I, uh, I I was driving on the way here to the Sabine to uh, ride around for a few days, and I I'm like, does it does it really happen? Did it really happen? I look up. <laughs> That check that stuck up there in the visor, and I'm like, one, two, three, four, five, six, zero. Yep, it really happened. <laughs> so, so, so it, yeah, it's uh, it's definitely a, been a dream of mine, and uh, it, it came true this week. I, it's crazy how things come together um, when it's going your way, and, and things happen that shouldn't normally happen. A fish comes up and and bulls up on top or you get one hook in the top of his head and he's like a four and a half pounder and you land him and stuff like that that doesn't normally happen it starts happening and going your way and you can feel the momentum coming and uh, it's just an amazing feeling when things are going your way well it i i watched a lot of it and it was impressive i was you know watching bassmaster live um you know watching you catch top water fish um I, I, I watched the most impressive thing. Have you dried out yet from your, your swim in Lake Travis? <laughs> yeah, I have. I, you know, that was a, a crazy deal. That the big fish were schooling on those shad. They were, there was just a few shad spawning in that marina, and those big ones were chasing them around. And I was going around to work the other side of that marina, and there was a boat actually parked in that slip, and a, like a three-pounder blew up on something. So I just pitched my bait over in the slip, and it hit the water, and the fish immediately had it. And my whole thought process was, you know, you can't uh, bump the dock and uh, lost my balance and fell in. Um, that fish actually, I think, came off, got back up in the boat, um, we're kind of joking around, fish come off, went to get my bait, and there was another little fish on. Didn't realize I stepped on the dock, and I, and, uh, I incurred a penalty. So uh, it was a funny situation, but it was a frustrating situation because it cost me 15 minutes uh, on, on day four. And, um, you know, I didn't get there, but, um, you know, 15 minutes later, and I don't know if you noticed or not, but on day three, I caught most of my weight in that first you know 20 25 minutes that i got there so i don't know if they had already finished on day four when i you know got there i don't know if it mattered but uh i'm glad we were able to pull it out and that 15 <laughs> minutes didn't cost me i'll tell you that man you know i watched and i didn't notice the penalty uh what what was the penalty for for just putting so, your foot outside the boat yeah anytime you land a fish and you you leave the boat technically i left the boat because i shifted my weight when i stepped on the dock i shifted my weight to that foot that i stepped on the dock and i landed that fish and i didn't realize that that's what i did and we actually weighed that fish it didn't count it wasn't us a, uh, a fish that i ended up weighing in for that day but it was a fish that i weighed it had i have noticed that that's what i had done and called the tournament officials and said hey i got this illegal fish i'm turning it back loose I stepped on the dock. I'm not not measuring it, not weighing it, or whatever. They said I wouldn't have even incurred the penalty. But since I didn't notify them and we weighed the fish, you know, I, I had to serve the penalty box violation. So, wow. Learn. Yeah, is that the, is that a penalty in in the regular elite tournaments, or is that specific to this tournament? It it is. Um, matter of fact. A matter of fact, uh, I think uh, Jacob Wheeler was sight fishing at Grand. He was standing next to a dock, and he had one foot on the dock, one foot on the boat. And, you know, they claimed that he shifted his weight to the foot that was on the dock, and he he got the same penalty I did. So I got gotcha. you. I got gotcha. you. Wow. Well, I, I learned something new there. But, uh, yeah, it was a spectacular fall in the water. Um, 
we want to prove the whole, the whole the whole time I was thinking, you know, the video of Ike when he broke his line that one time, jumped in, <laughs> grabbed the rubber rail, grabbed the line. That was what I was going through my mind in slow motion was maintain contact with the boat and I grabbed the rubber rail and they were like, You did fantastic. You stayed in the boat, you know, you, you held on to it. But right here, you know, you stepped on the dock. So you know <laughs> just a I guess just a brain fart on my part, you know. Yeah. Well what what what, what is that say? rule? You you what if you would have let go of the boat? What would have happened then? I guess I would have left the boat and if you know, same type deal. If I'd have landed penalty. fish, would have been an illegal fish, yep. Ah, uh, okay. I got you. Well, it was spectacular. I actually, I actually fell in uh, on a Bassmaster Top 100 tournament uh, down on the Red River. So there's some, there's some rare footage of me. Uh, <laughs> I was standing on my trolling motor bracket, trying to cast to a beaver dam behind these bushes, and uh, I turned around and I just stepped into the river for no apparent reason, right up to my neck. But it was cold. The water I stepped in was like 55 degrees. Oh. Uh, yeah, oh, at yeah. least you had warm water. <laughs> oh yeah, it was refreshing. <laughs> it was like nine degrees, like bath water almost. <laughs> well, it was a, it was an impressive win. I did see it. Um, I saw how you smashed them up on day three. Now, of course, your penalty uh, may have impacted your ability to do that first thing in the morning. But the thing that I noticed was that, like a lot of guys would struggle later in the day, but you you didn't. You kept generating those bigger bites throughout the day, especially late in the day. Yeah, um, you know, that kind of materialized in the tournament. Um, I stayed with David Mullins, and on the third day of practice, he came up to me about noon and said, hey, man, you know, I've had some, some blow-ups on top water. And uh, I'm like, really? So I started running it just for the last couple hours of practice and I had a couple bites and um you know I thought you know this might be a deal but I had my own thing that I was doing I was running marinas I had some bushes up the river I was going to go flip I can kill a limit out but my main big fish deal was those marinas first thing in the morning so first day ran marinas um the water had gotten too hot and I think the shad in those first two marinas had moved out offshore but I was lucky enough to catch one really big one the first day like a 510 or 511 then i ran up the river and, and uh, i think i had ended up having four fish at like one third and uh, it didn't work out up there so i said you know i'm gonna give this top water deal a chance um pulled into the first stretch of the same stuff that i got bit on in practice caught a three caught a two um caught two more keepers so i'm like hey this you know there's something to this and uh on day two Ran the marinas again in the morning, had like a limit for six pounds. It was like nine o'clock. Um, and at this time, I'm like, man, I just got to catch eight or nine pounds and make 10 grand. And uh, picked up the top water, caught a three. I'm like, that's 10 grand. And just rolled with it and steadily increased my weight throughout the day and really fine tuned what they were on. And what they were on was those 45 degree banks and those shallower pocket banks with the big chunk rock that would you know give some shade when that sun was real high those wolf packs were positioning in those shade shade lines and feeding on shad or bluegill or whatever and the key was you had to run into a wolf pack if you ever brought it over just one bass he would follow it all the way into the boat so you had to run a bunch of water and really track down those wolf packs to get them to commit to bite and good, good. uh could you see them before? Oh, yeah. A lot of times you would see them coming to your bait, and, and it, it would be four or five bass ranging anywhere from two to five pounds. And a lot of times that two-pounder would try to get it. So you would try to work it fast and get it away from him because if you could ever get that smaller one to bite at it and miss it, one of those big ones was going to swallow it every time. And uh, a lot of times they were just three, you know, some threes and fours, but it was a real exciting way to fish. Um, I didn't see all of them, you know, but when it was slick calm, you could definitely see them coming to get it. Well, it was awesome. That now you could hear you that bait, man. It was like dunk, 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 dunk. I could hear you working it. Uh, show it to us. It tell is. tell us about yeah, the bait you were using. So, th so this is a Bagley knocker bait. It's a it's a really loud one knocker sound, and I alternated between this bait. It's about a four inch bait, and when it was sunny. I don't have this in a clear version. I threw a uh, actually an old old Dixon. It's a clear, a um, little bit longer bait, 
but the key is this feather on the back and that the the fish the bait fish that they were feeding on was really really small and i think that feather a lot of the time that i you know was unhooking fish i noticed that they were really keying in and that, that feather was what was hooking them so i think a lot of the bites were coming because of this little feather on the back i think that was a big key but the you know the main thing is that loud one knocker sound to call them up you know a lot of them were anywhere from four to eight feet deep you know in that rock the water was really clear and uh, you needed that calling power and this loud bait did that did you uh i i saw you working it you did did you erratically retrieve it did you use a steady retrieve i heard you talk about burning it when you saw them but uh what was your retrieve like just just a steady retrieve uh for the most part if i uh if I had them, you know, some, you know, I'm fishing down a bank and a lot of times they would come up schooling or busting shad and I would throw it out there and I would work it really fast, as fast as I could work it. Mm-hmm. But, uh, most of the time just a steady retrieve. You, uh, now I heard a lot of guys, you can hear the braid zipping through the eyes when guys were catching fish. Uh, a lot of guys use braid on top water. Some don't. What, what's your, uh, what's your line choice? So oh, I'm a hundred percent on braid. You know, I put number two owners on here. And the reason why is because I was having a lot of fish not commit. And, you know, especially, I know that's the reason why I caught at least three of the fish this week is because I had really big hooks on there. And when I, you know, that's just my style. I'm a big hook, big line, big rod kind of guy. And uh, anytime that I can put that to work, that's, you know, that's what I'm going to utilize. Um, a lot of guys say, you know, mono, the stretch with these, you know, small hooks you know is a little bit more forgiving not me i just i like to get them hooked and get them in the boat i can boat flip everything you know 65 pound cigar smack down and you know that's the route i go <laughs> I'm, I'm a drew on that one <laughs> that, man i don't own a number two treble hook I, <laughs> that's like a gaff man <laughs> hey yep. drew i got a question why why do you think a lot were there bluegill spawning like what why do you think a lot of those fish were up there wolf packing or was it yeah there, there was some bluegill spawn, and I really didn't know that until the last day. Some of the pockets that I were fishing, I would go in. Matter of fact, one of them that, that David actually told me about, he had gotten two blow-ups in. And um, I fished it on days three and four at the end of the day, and we would both get bites in that pocket around the same area, but we couldn't see the bottom. And, uh, you know, I got to thinking, and I was telling myself, you know, there's probably some brim beds in here somewhere. Well, I went on down the lake to a similar pocket, looked exactly the same, and went in the back and uh, caught caught a pretty good one real quick and buzzed up there, and there was about 70 brim on a bed. So I, there's no doubt in my mind there was a lot of brim bedding too, but there was also schools of those tiny shad just swimming down the bank everywhere you look in big balls. Um, don't know why they were up there when they had all that deep water to go suspend over but uh they were definitely some shads from down the bank as well well you know everybody knows that that top water only works in the morning it doesn't work in the middle part of the day <laughs> <laughs> you flew in the yeah, face it, of that one well for me um it's always been a big time post-spawn killer around the house like seminole um you know where i'm from may uh all the way to to really june when they come off the beds you can throw a walking bait and catch catch fish really well um don't know what it is about it i don't know if it's uh really appealing to them it looks like an easy meal but um even when the sun's out they they tend to bite this top water really well well i and i noticed that like the so the whopper plopper was getting some bites <laughs> that style of bait uh, but the walking baits were were definitely killing it and uh clear clearly you won that tournament with it but uh well that was a, that was a great win man i mean i i was completely impressed with it uh you know you got the blue trophy is it did it travel with you in the passenger seat down to uh texas actually or- no um you know my wife and my little one flew in uh to, to watch the way in and uh it's in the back next to little man um <laughs> right in the so uh but i uh, know real quick i you know I was catching them really good in that marina on day three, and um, I I have I owe a lot of respect to Marty Robinson. I called him up um, after I incurred the penalty on day three, 
And, uh, I, you know, I said, hey, man, I'm not asking you not to fish in there whatsoever. I know you got, you know, some stuff on the line, too. Um, but I'm not. I'm going to be 15 minutes later, and if you want it, you can have it. Just let me know. I just need to know, so I'm going to start somewhere else. And he said, hey, man, I've done made up my mind. You know, mm-hmm. and I know the fish in there are, are there to win. And he said, I'm giving the whole thing to you. And uh, hats off to him. A lot of respect. And uh, we got some great guys we fished against. So, um, I heard, you know, what happened over at FLW and, you know, that could have went either way, but, um, the situation that, that I was faced with was definitely handled the right way. And I, I thanks to Marty Robinson for doing that. Yeah. Well, that, that's awesome. So what you're saying at no time after leading this tournament, did you decide to quit and go home? No, not at all. <laughs> <laughs> but I, we, we fished in there together. We fished in there together on day three. And, uh, I mean, we talked and cut up and talked about what we were getting bid on. And then day four, he let me have it exclusively to myself. Well, that's that's tremendous that he did that. That's, you know, that's the etiquette we were talking about before. And uh, gentlemen and sportsmen, and I mean, we're out there competing. But, you know, you – you know, you got to try to communicate, and that's what you did. You know, you and Marty got together, and, and you communicated, and you staved off any any potential disaster or meltdown or red line like BTC likes to talk it or call it. Um, so, yeah, that, that was that was terrific. E, we got the IM boards lit up. You got any uh, questions for yeah. Drew? So, so, Drew, we know you were working this topwater technique in these marinas, but Mark in Tennessee wants to know, what are two other favorite techniques that you might have for fishing marinas when they're not necessarily hitting top water? Yeah, actually, um, on the last day, my the first fish that I caught um, was on a six-inch nickel spoon. And uh, what was happening is after they would feed initially on top on those on those shad, they would get under those docks and suspend um, to five, ten, fifteen foot and uh you throw that flutter spoon in there and just let it sink about 15 feet rip it up off you know rip it up in the water column three or four times and then go to the next slip and i caught a 411 actually um on day four that way and it had five more bigger than it (laughs) swim out with it and never could get one of those to bite but i got that one to fire um a lot of guys that i had talked to had also had success on that flutter spoon in docks, main lake docks, marina docks up in the day when the sun was high and that was the only shade for them to get in that clear water. Um, and if I remember right, James Watson won uh, MLF, same type scenario on, on a dock deep. I think it was like a Ozark Lake, maybe Table Rock or somewhere. Um, same type scenario, flipping a, a spoon into docks. Another way we were catching them later in the day was jerking the, the edges, sides, and corners. Any any shade of those docks, we were jerking them. And s- same deal with the uh, the top water. If you had one fish come out after it, chances were he was just going to follow it into the boat. But if you had three or four come out, one of them was going to get it. They were just going to get competitive and bite. But that was about the uh, three main ways that I was catching them on docks. Did did you see? Any, did you catch any doubles this week? Uh. In practice, the after Mullins told me that uh, he was getting some bites on top water, the first pocket I pulled into, first wolf pack to come up, I had a three and a four on the same top water. Awesome. Um, I had I had it on twice uh, during the tournament. Um, both times the bigger one come off, but neither one of the fish were you know going to be players. But I did have two doubles during the tournament. That's cool. Well, we're going to be giving away. Uh, courtesy of Drew, some some Bagley's baits, the exact uh, one. Is that what it's called, a one knocker? Yeah, uh, it's actually called a knocker B. A knocker B. I'm sorry, a knocker B. We're going to be giving away five of those. Thanks for uh, making those available to us, and uh, they're going to be coming to. A, um, we're going to be picking some winners from our IM board. And you got another question for Drew? Yeah. E? So we might have touched on this briefly, but I think it's an important topic. Why were you choosing a walking bait over, say, a plopper, a wake bait, a larger size popper, like some of the competitors were throwing? What what made the walking what? bait that X factor? Well, I actually had all three of them tied on uh, the second day, and I experimented um, a lot with them. You just didn't get to see it on live because I didn't have a camera in my boat. Um, 
but I experimented back and forth and it seemed like I got more bites and more fish to commit to this walking bait. Uh, I got a lot of followers with the plopper um, and some other other style baits, but it seemed like even when a fish would blow up on this and not really commit, I could still hook him. Um, with that plopper, you got a lot going on and if they blow up on it, um, you might ne not necessarily hook them. So that's the reason why I chose the walking bait. Well, it certainly uh, it worked well for you to win the tournament. You got more eat? Yeah, I think this is a pretty interesting question. We kind of forget this sometimes during these four-day tournaments. Did weekend boat traffic affect you at all out there? Absolutely. <laughs> and, you know, I was very fortunate that I got off to a uh, fast start on day three. Um, I'll give you an example. So um, I started in that marina, and I caught like 17 or 18 pounds. And um, I was pumped because the best part of my day was not even close to begun yet. So um, I was waiting for the sun to get up. I went to my best stretch, and by the time I got to it at 10 o'clock, it was a four-foot mud line on the bank. Mm -hmm. And there was an astronomical amount of big boats just riding around, skiing, um, and running off the bank down by you, waving. You're, throw, you're trying to throw a top water, and they just don't even realize what they're doing. But the, I think when it muddied up those banks, um, it just backed those fish off, and I never could get a bite on main lake stuff. I just I kept running. I threw a jerk bait, and I can get bit on a jerk bait, but they just weren't the quality. And um, I kept at it and kept at it, kept running pockets, and, and finally I figured out the same type pattern would work in pockets. And... Um, I was able to cull two more times late in the day on day three and uh, was very glad to do it. But they, those were in protected pockets where boat traffic wasn't affected. Um, on day four, again, I was fortunate because the, the nasty weather kept all those boats off. So when the, the marina didn't pan out and only had one fish, I was able to run that main lake stuff. Even though it was raining and the sun wasn't out, there wasn't the boat traffic, so I was able to capitalize on some bites um because there wasn't boat traffic had there been a bun bunch of boats out there on day four and i didn't catch them in the marina probably wouldn't have won so very fortunate in this one how it all stacked up and lined up <laughs> things happen the way that they're supposed to sometimes yep. that's right everything happens for a reason i'm a firm believer in that i tell you you know it's it's funny because it has a great question about the boat traffic and we're going to send that guy a prize absolutely um the one of the knocker bees but uh you know i thought about boat traffic right everybody was talking about it and the rough water and how impossible it was to navigate but i did it's the first time i'm hearing anybody talk about and it, it you know how it muddy it's muddying up the banks um yeah that, that's a big factor in, in uh in heavy boat traffic that especially if you're on a shallow pattern like you had yeah, absolutely, especially throwing top water. I mean, not only is the bank muddy, but you got two footers rolling in there and fish trying to, you know, track down this bait in those waves, you know. And uh, two, it made it where, like, it was taking me 20 minutes to run to, you know, where I was fishing. It would take me 45 minutes to get back to weigh in. It was so rough getting in. But luckily, I was in a Phoenix, and it ate that chop up. We, you know, we... We were able to run in, you know, 50, 60 miles an hour across all those waves. So, big deal. That That's crazy because that's hard to navigate. I mean, when you got boat track, you know, it's not like rhythmic waves like you get up on the Great Lakes or a big lake, you know. It's it's like confused. Yeah, they're worse. A washing machine. <laughs> well, they're worse. Uh, that, that certainly was, uh, was a major factor. What a great adjustment. I mean, what a great adjustment to move into the pockets and look for that habitat in the pockets. That, that to me, that's the winning move. I mean, that that clearly won the tournament for you. That was, uh, I mean, did you you didn't did you have any of those at practice that you had found, or did you just develop yeah, that during the tournament? Yeah, there was a couple of them, and I believe Mullins actually told me he got bit in pockets. But okay. all my bites were out on Main Lake stuff, uh, Main River. Um, channel swing banks uh outside pockets you know all the main lake stuff was what i was targeting so i kind of you know leaned on my pal again and uh you know kind of made it work so was this something that was just going on were you fishing up the lake or was it near the dam what was it yeah, something that it, was just going it on seemed like, 
Yeah, it seemed like it was that upper third of the lake was where it was working. If you got down um, further south, the further south you got, the more clear the water got, and it just wasn't working down there. I think the fish stayed deeper down on that end because it was so clear. Um, and then when when you got up there where we were, it was a little bit more colored. There was more fish. You saw more bait fish and everything up shallow. So I, it was only working in that area of the lake, I'm, I'm pretty sure. Well, I tell you, I watched you land some of these fish and you did some amazing hand landings of these fish i the one i i mean you got treble you got number two gaff treble hooks flying these fish are coming in hot uh and you had to you had this one that you just kind of swiped into the boat over the oh, yeah. steering wheel I saw that. the treble <laughs> hooks were flying i'm like oh man what what a great catch uh that had to be exciting to go through all that stuff yeah, he uh, <laughs> that was a like six and a half pounder. Um, <laughs> I actually saw that fish. It was suspended up under one of the floats in the very back of one of those slips, and I was like, "Is that a carp?" Because there's a lot of carp up under them things sucking that algae or whatever off the bottom of those floats. And I just flipped my bait up there to it, and it sharked out there after it and swallowed it. I mean, I had only mm. twitched it like twice, <laughs> and it was the most awesome, ferocious bite you've ever seen, and fought it around the boat and it come back to the back and i got it turned going forward and i just pulled it up and it was trying it was fixing the jump there by the boat and i just put my hand under it and just throwed it over the console <laughs> <laughs> that was an awesome highlight uh a lot of guys are fishing tournaments no nets you get do, how do you keep your cool do you have any advice on on how guys can can do this uh, get better at hand landing their fish in a tournament and, man <sighs> To be honest with you, any time I can scoop them without them going crazy, it seems like that's the most efficient way because even if they kind of slide out of your hand, you can always just kind of flip them in the boat like I did that one. Any time you go to playing with their mouth and trying to lip them, that's when you're getting these hooks in the fun zone in your hands and everything <laughs> else. So uh, I, try to, I try to scoop them any way I can. Plus, it's a whole lot easier to pull a hook out of your arm than your hand. Because <laughs> it's... It, fingernail and everything else i can i can attest to that is that uh, true btc <laughs> yeah we we've, we've got video from yesterday of a whopper plopper in my pinky so oh, <laughs> yeah on yeah look, look for that coming soon you needed to be scooping btc yeah we, we had an incident yesterday <laughs> a couple incidents yeah, <laughs> yeah. uh uh Aid, we got any more ims yeah for uh, a couple asking about the sabine moving on are you good with lake travis do you think Anything more we need to touch on with that? I, I'm happy to go on to the Sabine. Yeah, Drew, uh, a couple people want to know your thoughts on that. What do you think? Do you think it's going to be a flippers event? Do you think another technique might prevail? What are your predictions for the Sabine this year? Oh, um, well, I really don't want to say. No, <laughs> uh, no uh, honestly, I think, um, I think somebody's going to win the Sabine running up and finding some current somewhere because it's going to be hot. Um, I think the flip and bite might prevail the beginning of the tournament, but I think if you can find um, where you can catch consistent weight in this ter in this derby in some current somewhere, so, um, for me I've always done well in current when it gets hot, and if if you can if you can find a current orient oriented situation and uh, locate some bass that way, I think that's how you're going to do well in Sabine River tournament. It's now the flood is over down there now, I'm assuming, and uh, things yeah. are back to normal. You guys can get around a little bit. Yeah, it, it, it has come down quite a bit. I I, uh, I didn't I actually stayed um, in Austin last night and drove over. I didn't get here till about 1 o'clock, and I put in over um, close to Houston and didn't do anything. So I'm over here um, actually on the Sabine. I'm going to run around um, over here close tomorrow and see what it looks like. Excellent, excellent. Uh, we got uh, the rest of the schedule coming. Are there any other uh, tournaments on the schedule you're looking forward to? Uh, yeah, I'm looking forward to get back to the Mississippi River and do some frogging and, you know, shallow water river fishing. You know, that's kind of what I like to do. Um, uh, you know, I've got a couple opens left. I'm sitting pretty good in the points in those. I know i got that classic berth, so I'm really not too concerned with the opens anymore, but um, it would be awesome to, you know, kind of win the points in that. I'm, I think I'm sitting in second or third in the points. I have two top 12s. 
looking forward to both of those. Um, you know, I'm looking forward to the Chesapeake. You know, I'm from Panama City, Florida. Um, I grew up fishing tidal fisheries, not maybe as much of a tide swing as you guys have on the Atlantic coast, but um, I understand how fish are affected by tides. It's got grass. It's got, you know, some of the elements that I've seen before and I'm used to, so I'm excited about that one as well. And you can't you can't go without mentioning the St. Lawrence River. Um, that event there could be unreal. Um, I, I remember Kevin talking at the last um, the last one we were at last year. It could take a hundred pounds to win in smallmouth there. Um, the time of year we're going, for it, they're all deep and big and fat. So I'm excited to go there as well. Is it a different time? What time of year are you going to St. Lawrence? I think we're going we're going later this year. Okay, I it's our it's our last event. It's in August. Oh, okay. To see. Yeah. Has, has there ever been 100 pounds of smallmouth weighed in anywhere? I think on Erie one time somebody did, I think. It would have, it, it would have been weighed in at Mille Lacs if we had had a four-day event in our Angler of the Year championship. But it was since it was a three-day event, I think Seth won it like six, or 75 or 76 pounds. Wow. <laughs> That's amazing. Yeah, I, think I, I think I had 22 pounds a day in that deal, and I finished ninth. <laughs> Man, what did it? What did Kevin have last year at Thousand Islands when he won? Ninety, uh, like like ninety ninety five or ninety six yeah, pounds. Close. I think. Yeah. yeah, yeah. Those places are amazing. I mean, the the smallmouth are so big and they're so numerous, and, and they look different there. Like the yeah. shape of them, they're 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 squares. They're a totally different look. Yeah, than anywhere yeah. else you catch them, it's yeah. wild. Cubs. Mm-hmm. <laughs> Dude, we just caught some smallmouth today on on the uh, Chesapeake, and uh, yeah, they they're longer, they're yeah. thinner, they're like the <laughs> fish you catch in Tennessee. You yep. know, they got a different look about them. The the ones up north are they're literally footballs. Mm-hmm. I mean, they look like footballs. Well, you got a great uh, tournament schedule in front of you, and how cool is that? I honest, let's I love win and you're in in the classic. I love that. I think that was the greatest thing. Um, I'm glad, I, and it looks like we Drew may have froze. It might be back now, but uh, I'm super psyched that that uh, that gets you into the classic for this tournament. I wish they would bring it back all all across the board. I thought I thought it was awesome. Yeah, I like I like it too. You know, and and we were just talking about it on the way over here. You know, what more perfect tournament pick to win? I mean. Um, you know, I got off to kind of a lackluster start this year. You know, I have a, like a 101st finish at Martin, a 73rd, and then a, a 44th or 45th at the last one. So, I mean, I was steadily climbing up the points a little bit, but to win this one really takes some pressure off for the rest of the season. You know, I can really go out and fish loose and, and kind of do what I want. He might win him another one fishing that way. <laughs> uh, well, we, we just saw another guy do that. Yep. Maybe, maybe uh, you'll get two in a row. Maybe so. I, I I'll definitely be trying. I'll tell you that. <laughs> uh, yeah, that was well. That was uh, it was an amazing win. It's a game changer. Um, it, well, clearly this is the biggest tournament that that you've won. Um, you know, they can change an angler. You know, when you do you feel different? Yeah. Do you feel like you learned something by winning this tournament that you you didn't know before uh, before winning at this level? Well, I tell you what I, I, I did learn, um, you know, in 2013, when my first year on the tour, I entered and won the very first event at Lake Okeechobee. Um, and I, I didn't take it for granted, but I didn't understand how, in, you know, how hard it was to win one. And it took the struggle for the last um, five years for me to really, really understand what all goes into you know, actually winning one of these events. Um, and I can definitely say I really appreciate it a lot more now than I did then. I just didn't understand it. Um, you know, I, you just can't describe how good of a feeling it is to know um, all these guys that you idolized, you know, growing up and, and everything. The best in the world, 108 of them, they can win at any time. And for one week, you you know you top them you beat them and, and nothing nothing else more can be said about that. Well, you did you did a heck of a job, Jacob Wheeler. Certainly, you can made you earn it. Uh, 
you know, he was out in front most of the day, and uh, you kept your cool after the morning, didn't go your way, and, uh, you know, just kept kept steadily gaining. Uh, that was impressive. I, I don't know if, uh, man, I would have hated, I hate when you know what the other guys have. Mm-hmm. You know, would would you have wanted to know that Jacob was way in front at moments during the day or not? No, I, I just knew um, I was getting enough by that I'm going to have my five opportunities. And that's all I could ask for. I kept telling myself, you know, when I got that second fish on top, I'm like, hey, this is going to work. I'm, you know, this is work. I'm just going to keep this top in my hand and do it. Right two pounds and I, okay that's three hours and more opportunity got four hours to do it uh, i'll be going down the bank whenever i no, i didn't have much weight like one and a half pounds but i felt like i was gonna win because i knew i had at least three more hours and i was gonna get at least one one three pound bite and that was all it's gonna take i ran to the point that um i had the same three pounders i found your Follow my bait in bush all three days of the time, and it was fun time. And I turned around and told the camera, I said, every time the three pounders followed my bait out and not bit. And it was kind of drizzling rain a little bit. I threw up there, walked it about three or four times, and that fish came out and ate the bait. I said, there he is. And brought, brought that fish in. It, and whenever I got that fish in the boat, I knew it was over. I That's mean, it so just, awesome. it, I mean, it's awesome feeling. Man, it's great reliving this with you. You know, and uh, people that want to follow you, uh, you're, you know, your household name now, they're going to want to do that. Uh, Facebook, Twitter, uh, where can they find you? Uh, Instagram's Drew Bent Fishing, Facebook, Drew Bent Fishing, Twitter, DB Fishing. So uh, that'll be how you find me. That's why I couldn't find you on Twitter. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I was looking. I, I guess fishing was taken on twitter it wouldn't let me choose that one i got you <laughs> hey well um you know congratulations again amazing win um just on a side note you you talk like george cochran i didn't know if you knew that but just like nope. george, we're gonna call you george cochran jr you got the same exact accent um i i you know who, who better to compare he's, he's only won a few classics and flw championships so i guess it's a good guy to sound like but um hey Continued success. We wish you continued success. Thanks for the uh, the knocker bees. Uh, I really we appreciate that. We're going to be giving. Yeah, them we out to we paid guys. for them, Pete. Oh, we paid for those. Yep. <laughs> I take that back. Well, <laughs> have ba- have Bagley send us you. Thanks for nothing, Drew. <laughs> <laughs> well, I'll tell you this. I'll tell you this. I had to uh, call Don from uh, Bagley on the way here and say, Hey, hey, man, I'm going to need you to ship me some more knocker bees. I, I gave them all out at uh, Travis when I got off the water. Everybody wanted one, so I gave out every one that I had. <laughs> uh well i hope he send you some more yeah might be struggling oh, to keep them in stock yeah right now. yeah bt brian will be texting you our address maybe he could send some our way too that's right <laughs> but, hey hey man congratulations again good luck the rest of the season and uh congratulations i guess you were the first qualifier for the bassmaster classic i guess so now that uh the win you're in is not not anymore for the opens i guess so but yeah. I'm, like, I'm pumped to get back. You know, it's one of those events that's definitely life changing, and uh, I'm excited to get back. That's for sure. Excellent. Well, wish you the best of luck. Thanks for taking time to talk to us at Bass University TV, and uh, we'll all be watching, Drew. Thanks a lot, buddy. Yeah, congrats, man. Thank you. Congrats, Thank champ. you, guys. Woo, woo. That was awesome. I love reliving that story. Um, but I, when I first started, uh, I fished a couple of the ttbc's Mm -hmm. and uh they had that that ridiculous beeper that would beep every time somebody caught a fish oh really in the tournament you know i can't great for television (laughs) bad for my head i mean i just can't take it when i know what somebody else is doing and and it's the hardest thing like he when he was saying earlier you know just keeping your cool when you don't have them early Mm -hmm. and you've been catching Mm -hmm. them early that's one of the hardest things to do in tournament fishing it just Keeping your head when you know they're catching them and yep. you didn't, yep. in your prime time, and he kept his head on straight. Um, man, that 
that's tough. To well, do. that's maturity, and mm-hmm. you know that's tournament experience, and and uh, he pulled that together. I watched the squirrel on MLF uh, have a meltdown where he was leading by 16 pounds. Oh, uh, he had 16 pounds. They had next to nothing, and then his morning. It just went away what he was doing, and them guys steadily they call, they kept creeping yeah. up on him, and I watched him just spin out, and I'm like, that's me. I'd spin right out, <laughs> right next to him. <laughs> I can't take it. I don't want to know. I I don't want to see. I just mm-hmm. I I like I want to be like Drew, I like concentrating on what I know that I have to do. And uh, E, hey. you got a question? Yeah. Um, viewer had a good question, and I actually need to know this too because I gotta find that footage. That footage you were talking about earlier, if you've fallen off the boat. Uh, what war would you say was going on during that? Was it the Civil War? Was it World War II? <laughs> I'm gonna give, he said the Civil War. I'm going to give you the benefit of the doubt. Well, say it was at least World it was, War II. It was just Korea. after Jesus was born. <laughs> <laughs> it was a long time ago. Right, good. It, I, it, it, was, uh, it was actually uh, Davy Height won that tournament on the Red River. Yeah. Uh, I think it was 04. You better hope I don't find that footage, Pete. It doesn't. Well, I'm sure it exists, but I don't know why. See, back then... I get Ronnie Moore the, on that. The, <laughs> yeah, help. Oh fun. yeah. Ronnie. Back then, uh, that kind of stuff didn't make the shows, you know. Right. And um, that's when they had class. Yeah. Well, and I, I think I don't think I handled it like Drew. Drew was all smiles and happy, happy. Oh, I just fell in the water. Oh, it's great. I'm still going to win this tournament. I fell in the water and I'm like, I'm ruined. Now I'm not going to win the tournament. I was in a dark place, you know. So, that's awesome. Uh, I, I, I think maybe that's why it didn't make the the show. But uh, I man, I jumped. I walked right in the water, bro. I'm like, I'm standing up on the trolling motor bracket and and I'm frustrated because the fish didn't bite the way they did the previous day and i'm like i told i looked at the camera i said i'm going to turn around and i'm going to fish right back through there i'm going to get a limit and i did i turned around and stepping on the, the instead of stepping on the deck i stepped in the river forgot to bring the boat with you yeah i forgot <laughs> i forgot that part of the equation hey man uh guest showed up here speaking of cameras is our camera guy for tomorrow bud cipolletti bud's hey, in the bud. house bud's oh, in the house man. bud's the man Did, does bud have a bud no, I sure do. All right, <laughs> Bud Cipolletti. We're gonna. He's gonna be our uh, cameraman extraordinaire. Uh, I hope all your stuff is waterproof, Bud. Absolutely. Is it? <laughs> <laughs> we'll bring a big. We'll bring a golf umbrella. <laughs> Sounds good. Now Ponchos. we got. We got a little rain tomorrow. We're uh, like I said, John. Uh, we're gonna be doing some on water training with John Hunter tomorrow. Uh, Bud's gonna, you know, who does great work, is gonna be uh, filming, capturing a lot of this stuff. Uh, we're gonna be doing on water training, uh, jerk bait, blind, spawn fishing, and some other topics. Um, as well as we're gonna be doing some fishing. John and I are gonna go out and, and try to try to hoist some of these giant Chesapeake bass. Pete's gonna school me on the upper bay. <laughs> well, I tell I've you, heard all about it. It's it's it. This is such a good time of year. There I wish is. they would bring the elites here in May or June. Uh, instead of bringing them in the summer, the summer is it can be challenging. It certainly was for them last time mm-hmm. they were here. But man, May and June, the big ones are all around, and uh, you you got to see it. like there's so much life out there. Like the carp showed up today, first time I've seen them. They're getting ready for their spawn, mm-hmm. and I mean, forty pounders, just tons of them, and there you know five or six schools of them will just swim right by your boat randomly. They make wakes in the water, you know. That's crazy. Uh, and there's just and there's millions of pounds of it. The sh- the shad spawn, the herring spawn, uh, the striper spawn. It's like uh, awesome. it's like it's just such a mecca of of food and forage. So um, we're gonna we're gonna get out and ho- hopefully we can catch a few of those. I think we'll be able to. But I I appreciate Bud being here and and working with us. So you guys can all look for that. If you guys haven't subscribed yet, I just want to invite you. Uh, one more time, come on over to BashU.TV. Join the group. Um, you know, it more than pays for itself by all the benefits we give you through Rapala, through Lucky Tackle Box, through WeGo, through Popticals. We got more and more op- or benefits to all of our subscribers all the time. And we have content that is really, truly designed to help you become a better angler. It's going, you're going to go out and be able to do, have a better chance of duplicating these techniques after watching some of our training seminars that are done by the best guys in, in fishing. Uh, and they're talking about what they're really, really good at. So it really comes through in all of our educational stuff. I think I'll give away one of those too. 
Yeah, let's let's. Well, first, first, I think we should do the trivia question, and start getting oh, yeah. and start getting ready to get ready. Um. So. Okay. Okay, I'll trust you on that. All right. All right. <laughs> All right. We're gonna. John, you uh, you have this company um, that makes a very, very unique product um, that I think is awesome. We all use a similar thing on our iPhones. Yep. Um, talk to us about it. Yeah, so uh, what we got, it's called Graph Glass. It is a, uh, it's a timber glass screen protector for your fish finders. You know, we like Pete said, we all have them for our $800 iPhones. And uh, why do we not have them for our two to $4,000 electronics? <laughs> we put them through... I mean, we put them through way more than our phones. Um, How and, many screens uh, have you seen smashed? I've seen a lot of them. Yep. I mean, m more than you would think. Um, I know I would have busted mine the other day. I was coming out of a, I had to, you know, those tight pockets that you go mm -hmm. in. The only way you come out the back out, yep. sometimes you get a little turned sideways, and I rammed a limb right into my screen. And uh, these things just, they're they are so tough, man. They're going to protect your graph from anything. And, uh you know, they're nine inch hardness. They can't really scratch. Um, the biggest thing is they're oleophobic and hydrophobic. So they don't, they don't hold oil, which means fingerprints don't stick to them near as bad. They'll wipe right off. Um, and they're hydrophobic, which means water repels right off them. You won't get those water smears. It doesn't hold water spots. That's, that's a big thing with grass. You get yeah. a couple months in, you can't seem to get those water spots off. Um, and then with, the sun hits it and you, now you can't see. Yep. You can take a dry rag with these uh temper glass screen protectors on them clean them right off nice and uh, they're good to go wow yep now it's uh a lot of the units out there are touchscreen now um does that work on a touchscreen absolutely yeah we we have them for the lorance and uh solix touchscreens they work they don't work with the gen 2 lorances they're they're a little bit different touch technology okay but um i think it almost makes a touch sensitivity better on uh on the other ones because stuff doesn't stick to it as much and the water doesn't uh sometimes the water will distort your touch but this repels the water mm -hmm. and uh it just makes it a lot better in pretty much all conditions excellent excellent people uh want to get this product how, how can they yep. find it graphglass.com and they're on tackle warehouse okay so uh either of those places are are a great place to uh to do it and i'll tell you what i'll do i'll make a code that'll go for 24 hours for everyone watching oh and let's just make it I, when i get off it'll be available in what we're done in 30 minutes or so yep yep it'll be done right when we're done it'll be available for 24 hours and it's bass use the code and i'll give everybody 25 percent off wow standing yep How thank you yep nicely done 25 percent off uh what's the, are you gonna make up the code yeah i'll do it I'll do it right now. Okay. When, when we get done. All right. Or I'll do it right now. Right now. Right now. <laughs> this right is happening. Go now. order it. Bass U, all caps, B-A-S-S-U. Bass U. Okay. Yep. 25 Give it, give it off. just a moment here, guys, and, and you'll be able to go and order this product. It's just the same. It's the same protection that most everybody uses on their uh, on their phones, uh, but it's for your graph. And, and if you're like me, I mean, I fish all the time, and... and yeah, I get those water spots, and they're just a pain in the neck. Some of them become permanent, but you always got to be, you know, on top of them. It's hard to stay on top of it, uh, and this allows you to just simply wipe that stuff off, as well as the oil in your fingers because you got to touch your screen all the time. Um, that's a neat product. I got to get some, Brian. Yeah. And the deal is, you crack them. The manufacturers do not replace them. Yeah, I mean, it's you got to pay a refurb fee. It's like a thousand or two thousand dollars to get a new one. So. Yeah. You know, what's a $40 investment for one of these things? Protects your graph. If you do sell your boat in a year or two or replace them, peel it off, it looks brand new. So, yeah, well, Fantastic. resale value. I, I once saw a guy uh, redline and, and start drop kicking this sonar glass. Will it offer any protection in that case? Mm hmm. <laughs> I mean, I don't know. May, I, I can't promise that. We do have a one year replacement guarantee. If you crack your glass from impact, we'll replace it okay not your graph but the actual glass on it. if it cracks which if it cracks chances are your your actual graph's going to be fine we'll, we'll send you a new one okay and john what's the website address on that Gra again yeah it's graphglass.com g-r-a-p-h-g-l-a-s-s.com who who was drop kicking the uh screen yeah i don't want to i don't want to mention any names okay i can help <laughs> <laughs> yeah <laughs>
<laughs> I've seen I've seen windscreens get get drop kicked. <laughs> well, most of the screen most of the screens get damaged by like a roll cast or or drop kick or a drop kick. But a roll cast with a jig, it, it usually will get your console, or a flip cast will get your one up by the trolling motor. Yep. You know, and you just you're trying to get the angle on, you know, the dock, you know, and um, you know, you got to manipulate the cast, and and you put your graph, mm-hmm. it gets in the way, you know, sometimes. Yeah. And then, bu- buddy fishing on the back, that's another yep. popular one. Yep. Ooh. Yep. So hook sets can mm-hmm. come flying in and graphs or people in the eye or all kinds of things can happen <laughs> what's that or the client or, yeah, the clients. or if you're lazy like me and you never put the covers on them going down the interstate oh, oh never hitting them oh yeah that's a that's bad a one thing that i yeah i yeah. always forget that that's another so one. are we giving away one of them tonight yeah let's give away this one okay we'll do the 25 percent off and we'll give this to someone oh my goodness gracious what are we doing with it i don't know <laughs> <laughs> let's let's just let's just go to the IM board. We're going to give these All to right. our subscribers uh, the best IM que- the best questions that come our way, um, and we appreciate all you guys watching. Um, if you haven't subscribed, come over to Bashu TV and you can ask us questions. Uh, it's ten days free right now. Use the code TRYBU, um, and you can come and check it out. You don't like it, cancel it, uh, but we think you're going to love it. Um, we've got some of the greatest customers in the world, but. Uh, Brian, I think we're going to switch gears now. Oh, uh, and, and talk about fishing for spawning fish. Sure. Okay. Um, sh- shout out Mark Jeffries. Or I- I'll do it um, tomorrow morning over at, at the Bass Zone at eleven thirty Central Time. Um, Mark's got James Watson in studio, and there's a major announcement coming. Worldwide. Worldwide is going to be in studio at the Bass Zone, and he's going to drop some heat. Wow. In Mark's studio. <laughs> Excellent. We'll, we'll be we'll be out on the water filming, but Central. we'll be we'll have our uh, we'll have BTL on live. We'll be listening. Yep. Fast talk live. Excellent. All right. Go with. Excellent. Well, um, should we do the trivia question now, Bry? He's not listening to me right now, but uh, I think we do. <laughs> I'm in charge. We're doing the trivia question right now because I want to give you guys a chance to to answer this question. <laughs> and uh, John, you you're. Um, you know, we're giving away one of your cash and fishing rods. Whoever can answer this question, you've thought long and hard. You've been toiling. While you're out there competing in the FLW, I know you were thinking That's about exactly crafting it. this question. Yep. Uh, what's the question? Roll. Uh, well, see, I wanted to do a food-related question, but Brian, he said no. <laughs> it was his idea about the salad dressing. It was. John, where did you write the answer down real quick? Right here. All right, let's get that. Because <laughs> this may happen fast. Hide it. Block it from the camera. (laughs) (laughs) All right. So trivia question for the rod is, uh, what is the model number of the first cash and rod um, I ever owned? The first cash and rod you ever owned. And it's still my second favorite model. Okay. That that cash makes other than the the one, the jerkbait rod, which is the M8427. That's the jerkbait rod, but the... What is what is the first one I owned? It wasn't that one. All right, Bud, you're not allowed to answer. <laughs> <laughs> All right, we look forward to getting some of your questions in, guys, and um, we're going to be giving away that that rod. But um, I tell you, you know, I live in you know a place I fish a lot, the Upper Chesapeake. I do a lot of on water training trips. And by the way, I'm not the only on water trainer uh, for the Bass University. I want to invite you guys to go to the bashuniversity.com um and go to the on water training section and there's a list of all the trainers that we are working with in your part of the country uh drew benton being one of them he was um he is. you can schedule a trip <laughs> go out and learn how to you know use the one knocker i keep calling it a one knocker knocker b knocker b yep. i can't get that one yet uh, but you can go out and learn that live uh, our on-water training trips are designed to, you know, take the classroom onto the water. Uh, a lot of people learn a lot better hands-on, and that's what they're designed for. So we've got trainers all over the country that are there to help. You can schedule, um, you know, through our automated system there and get in touch with these guys. Uh, what we do is we have you fill out a questionnaire about where you are in your fishing, uh, whether you're a beginner, intermediate, advanced, aspiring pro, whatever it is. 
um, and that'll help the trainer work with you and design an individual training session with you. So you can check that out at thebashuniversity.com. But that's what I'm doing out here on the Chesapeake right now. And right now, what it's all about is the spawn. And it's surprising because it's been so warm. But our fish uh, in that part, in this part of the country, are just engaging in the spawn right now. Uh, I'm not. I'm not even seeing any post-spawn fry garters yet. Um, it's still about the spawn, but what the, what the problem is, uh, we have a tide. So the, often the depth over the spawning bed is so deep that you can't see them. Mm -hmm. And we've got a lot of stain in the water, so you can't see them. So you can't, s maybe about an hour a day in certain sections of the, of the bay, you can see the actual spawn taking place and target sight fish. Mm -hmm. Most of the time it's, it's blind fishing for spawning fish and um and that's what's going on out there right now and it's uh i just wanted to you know show some techniques that i'm using right now so all you guys that are you know watching us hold those pictures up on uh, on my facebook page or bass university's page um these are the techniques that i'm using right now and i'm going to show a couple of them to you and we're going to and i'm, I'm going to take out john tomorrow and he's going to be uh he's going to be going after him a little bit with the jerk bait but what, what I'm trying to identify is these spawning colonies, these places where the fish will set up. And it's mo it's the most amazing thing is like fish are schooling. They have schooling behavior. They have schooling behavior in the spawn. Mm -hmm. And once one of them um, starts bedding, more pull into that area and they start. Cluster up. Yeah, yeah. they start clustering up. Mm -hmm. not, not quite as tight as bluegills do. But pretty close, you know, and uh, and we have uh, the flats out there, which is like 25 square miles of grass flats that these fish like to use to spawn. They like to spawn in marinas. They like to spawn in your typical protected banks and, and all breaking that news. kind of stuff. But uh, what's that? We've got breaking news. We got a winner. We've got a winner. We oh. have a winner. How could somebody wow. know your first rod? That's what that's, I want to know. That's quick too. That <laughs> going on tackle warehouse, scrolling through. <laughs> yeah. Is but, that um, written somewhere? Uh. -uh. <laughs> Negative. All right. Blue Pro was the first one to get it right, and the answer is the M eight seven three seven three. And what is that? Yeah. What is that rod? That's a seven three, uh, medium heavy, mm. and uh, really. I love that rod just because it's just an awesome all-around rod. You know, you can use it for so many different techniques. I was, it's stout enough to flip bushes, but it's you know, good for mid mid-sized swim baits. I mean, it's just sight fishing. It's just a great all-around all-around rod. And that's what got you hooked on cashing. Absolutely, outstanding. Yeah, I remember when I first got it. I was a sophomore or junior in college. I was going to Pickwick, and I needed a new football head rod. And uh, I bought it and fell in love with it, and I've been using cash and rods ever since for about six years. Outstanding. Well, we'll be filming with them tomorrow. Uh, I've got a boat full of them as well. And uh, who who's the winner of that rod, E? Blue Pro. That's his username. Blue Pro. Congratulations. We will have you the brand new Hunter cash and rod sometime within the next six to 12 months. That's right. <laughs> <laughs> After we wear it out. <laughs> We're going to get it to you. We'll ship it. Somebody's going to ship it to you. We'll make it happen. Unfortunately. But, uh, Congratulations. We're not. The, we don't have a crack shipping department over here at the Bash U, but we're, we're getting better every day. But, um, so we're talking about we're talking about blind fishing for spawning. I want to invite you guys to send in your questions on this topic. Uh, it, it's it's a great way to fish for them. I personally I can get frustrated when I'm sight fishing for them. Um, it, you know, and you guys that have tried it before, you know how you have to aggravate the fish. You see them, and it, it can be very very challenging. So uh, I, I'm not a big sight fishing guy to begin with. So this is right up my alley. I like to. Uh, you know, I like to fish this way. I like to kind of jump them, ambush them, and they're that you can catch them a lot quicker that that way a lot of times. But certainly where we're at right now. But what goes on uh, during the pre-spawn is we're catching them on a lot of tools uh, like these, the power baits. Uh, this is a Rapala square bill. This is a chatter bait. Uh, this during in the in the pre-spawn, you know, when conditions get into the mid 50s and up. It's like everything in your tackle box works. Oh yeah, you know. Yeah, it's a great time to go fishing. Yeah, the fish are active. They're, yeah, that's that's prime time, yep. no doubt. And everything works, but what I found that 
when you fish one weekend and all this stuff is working and then you go the next weekend and after you've had a big warm front then nothing's working none of the power baits are triggering any bites that's a sure indication that those bass have made the turn to spawn locked on yep they have locked on that's a good that's a good term and uh and here's you know when they lock on now there are still days and, and john and i were talking about it even when they're locked on there are still days when you can get them to come up off that bed and defend it you know something that looks like a bluegill uh like these do and tomorrow uh, might be one of those days might be one of those days cloudy yep overcast the conditions will be right a little bit of rain we're not going to be able to film because it's going to be raining so we're going to have to fish unfortunately <laughs> during that period but uh but sometimes they'll work but day in day out when those fish have what'd you call it committed to the spawn locked on locked on uh when they've locked on the baits that i've been most successful with with our creature baits texas rigs uh jigs and soft plastic something that is fished down close to the nest in the nest uh because they're territorial uh you want to slow fish and get that through there and that just in, in this time of year it increases your chances of catching those four fives and six pounders those big females uh by getting down and 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 putting those fast moving baits away and making the commitment you know when they're locked down I locked down. I locked down the soft plastic, and I brought a, a couple of samples of of what I like to use. And one of my first baits that I like and is creature baits, and I got a whole series of them because I use a couple different brands of them. But these are the these are the baits. These particular baits are the ones that I have a lot of success in the area that I fish. Um, and you know, there's uh, a couple differences here. We've got we've got some. Uh, this is um, that Biffle Bug. I forget who makes it. Gene LaRue. Gene LaRue Biffle Bug, and this is a Strike King. And these have a lot of appendages, a lot of moving parts. They swim. There's a lot of action here, and it's a bigger bigger profile bait. Um, and then, you know, I've got something here that, that's a smallie beaver, a little bit smaller profile. The appendages are fixed. They don't swim. Uh, it's just got a little bit less action. When conditions get tight, and they're a little bit more difficult to trigger i can go to the smaller profile baits and i can get them that get them that way but how i'm rigging these is a simple um is a simple texas rig system and i think i have most of it sitting here in my flambeau um by the way those flambeau boxes float <laughs> even if they're full of jigs Wow, that's impressive. You, te you oh, tested they, that? They float tested. really well. They'll float for an extended period of time while you're collecting them all. Dave, Dave Brosnick oh. testing that one. Easy. We're not, <laughs> we're, not get, we're not giving that up, but yeah, they float. <laughs> oh, we got a story for Thursday? Is maybe, that what we're doing? Maybe, maybe not. <laughs> tune, in, tune in to Ike Live on Thursday night. We'll that, be, that's by that's the right. way, we'll be having an Ike Live on 7 p.m. Eastern time uh, right. this upcoming Thursday. Yep. Or, or 7.15. <laughs> i'll be here about quarter to eight yeah, exactly <laughs> hashtag watch live. That's right. um but what i'm going to use is a texas rig and uh you know i want to show you a couple different ones these are some vmc uh tungsten weights um and i'm, I'm using light weights like i want something that is going to be a, a quarter ounce something that is not going to just drop too fast or bury through there i, I want a slow fall this time of year i find a slower fall a lighter weight it just gets me more bites do you when, ever unpeg it when they're on do i ever unpeg it yeah i'm i'm about to discuss All the right, pegging sorry. situation just i'm getting antsy just be patient <laughs> i'm excited <laughs> it's a great question though peg it or unpeg it i unpeg i do not peg i brought out my um you know my barber stops i use them in a lot of applications but the main application to use this is when you want that bait to follow that weight when it's getting hung up in the grass or hung up in the wood and the bait's not getting down to where the fish are but in the early season a lot of times the grass is is sparse it's short um, and you don't have that problem so i don't peg the reason why i don't peg is i find that when i when i don't peg a bait i have a stronger strike to catch ratio i just land more fish when the weight's pegged mm -hmm. You know what what's happening more there leverage. more leverage and it's locking that weight right next to the hook and when you set the hook the first thing that comes out is that weight it pops the fish's lips and you you lose a percentage of them um by that weight free floating 
the oftentimes the the bass is going to grab that bait with the hook in it and that weight's going to sit on the bottom it's not even going to be in his mouth so a lot of times you get a better hooking percentage now and they feel the weight too of, of the bait when that's why you said the lighter one gets more bites they can right? actually feel what that that weight in there so. it doesn't feel natural right right yep. the lighter bait the lighter weights can be more effective but um now the round band offset shank is what i use a lot uh i use that because it it's convenient it keeps the bait nice and tight and it it works well but during the spawn one of the problems that you have is these fish aren't biting the bait to eat it mm -hmm. you know what i mean yeah they're biting it in pure defense to get it out of their out of right. their bed and out of their 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 home <laughs> mm -hmm. and oftentimes that means it's a soft bite mm -hmm. right they don't have it clamped down with intent to to consume it so they've got it between their lips they've got it partially yeah, they're in their grabbing mouth the whole bait most of the time most of the time they're not so what what i find is that uh you lose a lot of fish during the spawn you, you're going to lose them just because of the nature of the way they're taking the bait so i unpeg the weight as a as a tool and I use a straight shank hook, which increases your hookup percentage. So those are two of the, the ways that I try to offset uh, losing some of these fish um, during, during this time of year. You unpeg it solely for hookup percentage? The Yeah, so, well, solely. Uh, that's the number one benefit I find. In the uh, action of the bait. I think, I, think, I think it has a big effect on the action of the bait and, and mm. is beneficial that time of time of year yep I, I i don't disagree with it's, you and that may be true a lot slower fall and falling behind the weight yeah a lot of times the weight will get caught in the grass mm -hmm. and the bait's just kind of yeah you know mm -hmm. dangling around yeah i was there's... fishing that tube on peg when we were out yep. three of us yep that thing. i mean and it definitely does like a lot of times when it's falling the weight will separate from oh, the yeah, bait for sure so sometimes the bait is falling actually weightless yeah uh when it hits the bottom there there there's multiple advantages yeah. to it i think you yeah. know I typically unpeg, you know, and like I said, but the strike to catch is what's valuable to me. Okay. Being a tournament guy, um, mm -hmm. taking guys out, I want them to catch that fish. You know, uh, getting the bites fun, watching them jump and get off is, is not so fun. <clears throat> Actually getting the fish and taking a picture, you know, you know, we saw uh, E lose a smallmouth and he still cries about it on you know <laughs> on lonely nights <laughs> but um you know so anyway the strike to catch is definitely key and i love those the creature baits but one of the other baits that i really like to throw this time of year and i know it's going to be surprising to a lot of you guys <laughs> but um oh boo yeah <laughs> this bait <clears throat> is your my boat on the trailer is your stick bait <laughs> and there are um this is just an un unbeatable weapon in a lot of situations but during the spawn man it's it's like it, it it's un it's just so effective yeah. it will it will at times draw strikes when no other baits will uh this is a yamamoto there's a million others out there um but i love to throw this around the spawning beds and and i throw it uh a little bit differently i know wacky rigging is is real popular and and, and man i i, I have tremendous success throwing at texas and i know a lot of guys do too i i use i fish it wacky a lot of times too which is basically where you're hooking it in the middle it gives it a different action but i love to rig it uh texas style like this especially in a lot of the areas that i fish because to be honest with you the wacky rigging system is a snaggy system mm -hmm. oh for sure and you get you get around the beds, man. You finally get your bait in the bed, oh, and now you oh, now you're oh, hung up on oh, as a prime move a stick <laughs> <laughs> or a rock or or something, you know. And you know it's just it's infuriating, and you you'll miss. I think you miss some strikes that way. Mm, but sure. rigging it this way oh, is a, is a tremendous little tool. Or you cast it just past it, and you're pulling it almost there. And it, gets hung, that's, yep. it gets hung up that one it, stick. in the grass or worse mm -hmm. yet on a log and you got to go dig it out and the opportunities missed and it gives it a different uh approach it gives it more of a soft stick or soft jerk bait uh feel when you twitch twitch this bait's going to dart dart and then sink so it actually has the appearance of a bait fish when you rig it this way um which is i think effective because a lot of those bait fish are exactly what's in there trying to eat those bass's eggs um 
So I typically will use a four aught round bend on a five inch and it's a great little tool. One thing I really like to do is I like to get a little VMC uh, weight, a little nail weight. Yep. And you know, it's basically a Nico rig, you know, and it's just rigged, you know, weedless instead, but I'll tail weight it, I'll nose weight it sometimes. But when I'm fishing weightless, the, the, this becomes so important and and here's why is like when you're making those long casts and you have grass or you have wind or you have current a lot of times this bait can get hung up in the grass and it won't actually make it down to the nest uh by putting a little weight in it it causes it to find its way down into the nest which is what we want to do this time of year that keeps those fish biting um keeps giving you those opportunities so i'm you know if when it comes to the spawn if you commit what do you call it again locked on locked on if you lock on to the soft plastics <laughs> and you get down and you gotta get slow it's hard i'm telling you it's hard for the crankbait guys and the spinnerbait guys and the chatterbait guys to do it but if you can lock on to that slow fishing this time of year you're you're going to be happy come the end of the day um that's fishing around the spawn. We, do we have any IM yeah, questions? Yeah, Jay Roberts brings up a good point. A few people have, but um, he wants to know about the full moon pertaining to the spawn. What do, what do you guys have to say about that? Do you really find that it'll move big waves of fish up during the full moon? Is the bite better on the days after a full moon? What's your take on that? You, you want to tackle that one, John? My personal opinion about the spawn is the number one most important factor is the water temperature and the stability of the water temperature the, the days leading up to it. Um, the moon does affect them. I mean, it, it really does. You can you can see it, but more so than anything is the water temperature. I mean, that's that's what I've seen. I I, I would agree, and and I mean, I, I couldn't agree more. The moon phase is key. Of new new moon, full moon, uh, they they are a factor. But I put them down on the list. You mm -hmm. know, I put stable water temperature, sunshine too. Sunshine is huge. Mm -hmm. um, for us in our part of the country, the further you go north, it's length of day tends to be a real trigger for these mm -hmm. fish yep. because we'll see them bedding in in low 50s, 40s even. Uh, we'll see them starting to spawn yeah. because it's just they. they feel we have a short getting longer. We have a short window up yep. here. We've got like one month to get it done, and that's it. Down in the southern states in Florida and Texas, that those fish can spawn for four months. Some do it all, you know. Year, say say they do it year round in Florida. Yeah, that's right. Yeah. And um, you know, so the length of day, stable water temperatures. What else I've seen is a big factor in driving fish to spawn is when you get when conditions start getting close to getting right, and then you get a cold front that sits down, immediately followed by a stable warm front. Yeah, that's it's, it's mm -hmm. it's like the light switch boom yep. there there it is yep. you know and and you know we we seen that with dean rojas when he yep. set the record they that's say exactly what that happened cold snap to get them to get them ready because it's it's so warm down there and in a lot of places down south year year round you need that cold snap for them to 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 be ready like yeah. just like you said yeah make turn the light switch on mm -hmm. and that's what that's what happened we had a massive cold front followed by 80 degree days for three or four days in a row and that's when every bass in Lake Toho pulled up in front of Dean Rojas's boat, and, uh, <laughs> and he called. <laughs> but but yeah. um, they didn't pull up in front of my boat. Uh, uh. <laughs> Any other IMC? Yeah, this is an interesting one for John. Maybe not exactly talking about bed fishing, but John, do you have a panic box? And if so, what's inside of it? A what? A panic box. Oh yeah, um, ev everyone does, and I I have struggled to. Uh, to go to it in a couple tournaments this year and uh you know probably my confidence bait for getting bites is a ned rig um Woo. pretty much yes, anywhere sir. in the country um from anywhere it really does work anywhere the the ned rig's a, a great bait i like personally i like biwa makes a bait called the potato i've seen that yep yeah it's in the it's in the giveaway box yeah, well, um course, but it's a it's called a potato and uh it's very similar size um it's it's a great bait it gets bit put it on a 10th ounce head and uh that that is my new that is my number one go-to yeah. panic box bait that's a great little bait yeah. what else is in there you got any jerk yeah. baits in there no, nico rig you you okay. named mm -hmm. the jerk bait's not panic box i mean that's usually like 
gonna win this deal yeah exactly <laughs> um but uh yeah nico rig um basically just a nail weighted senko and uh a ned rig those are and a drop shot those three when do you go to the panic box try not to but (laughs) obviously i've had a couple just a couple bad ones this year because Mm. of that but uh no you you need to when it's tough and plan a doesn't work plan b doesn't work sometimes you just need to a lot of times you can't win a tournament on the first day but you can sure lose it Mm -hmm. and um sometimes it it, you sometimes you do have to pull the plug and say you know what what i'm doing is not working i need to go do what I know I can do just get a few bites and stay in this deal, stay in the hunt for a check at least or some points, and uh, it's really important to do sometimes. Jason Christie picks up a Senko. He wins the Bassmaster <laughs> Classic. Yep. Oh. Yeah. <laughs> I, I Not took, the first time that's been brought up. It yeah. took me a minute to find them because they weren't in the giveaway bag. I, I, I had them in my backpack. Got them? Yeah, these Sweet. these these are not getting given away. But uh, <laughs> what are these? This Those is that potato. potato they thing. actually weigh a little oh. more than than a TRD or something yeah. like okay. that. So they're they they cast really well. They skip a lot better for docks for people who fish docks. Um, some people find a Ned rig hard to skip just because they don't have the surface area of a Cinco or something like mm-hmm. that. But those potatoes are a lot wider and a lot fatter and way more so for marinas or docks anytime you're wanting to skip that ned rig that's that's the bait to use and they got a cooler name than yeah <laughs> ned rig yeah but <laughs> i Pete, like it i call it pete's little fingers <laughs> <laughs> they got the polish <laughs> sausage <laughs> fingers <laughs> vienna sausage fingers <laughs> no nah, that's a well the pan, panic box is key and we've seen it you know i mean you get stuck in your brain where you know you just feel like you in order to win the tournament you've got to do a certain thing but mm-hmm. at some point you know you've got to recognize that you know like jordan lee did he recognized that, hey man I've, I've got to pick up my my finesse stuff to try to win this tournament and he wins the classic you know and uh there's a time to do it but you're right you know what i i see a lot of guys do this too is they pick it up too early yeah no doubt you you don't want to do it too early um but you don't want to do it too late. There's a really fine line of, of when you need to do it, <laughs> and uh, that that's what it all boils down to. Tournament mm-hmm. tournament fishing is all about decisions, and when you're making the right ones, you're going to have great finishes. Absolutely. It is all about decisions. We got anything else hot on the IM board? rain does to the spawn and was my, my well, was not that's on an the entire time question epic eric uh, appreciate it uh because we've had a lot of rain and um you must be must be fishing the chesapeake with me but it's been it's been fishing um i mean we've had almost a week straight of rain and and what what happens the one the number one thing to overcome in that scenario is the water color uh which changes it, it can wipe out areas um and just the here's what i find fish that have locked down i got that term now i got that term locked um (laughs) the fish that have locked no matter what the water color does are likely to stay so fish that are protecting and defending that nest you still can are going to be able to catch them but what you find is new ones are not going to be showing up is what i find an awful lot of times so that's that's the number one thing and and you mentioned it john is like without the sun um, you know, I, 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 those fish tend to, they're almost holding back. They're holding back and they're, they're, they're not wanting to, um, make a bed because man, they recognize that it's tra- crazy conditions. You know, they could get, their eggs could get swept away by, uh, you know, an influx of current or mud. Uh, they won't get any sun. So they, they hold back and they don't spawn and they wait for this to, to stop and wait for that sun to come out and that sun definitely drives them to the bed you have any comments on the rain or clouds during the spawn no you nailed it the suns i mean it's killer it's i mean it's it's so obvious too when you go to a place like florida or a place where you can just see everything going on um the sun it's the number one factor yeah it definitely is and and like you said for down on the chesapeake where we have right now the spawn has kind of been delayed it's been kind of some areas have been muddied up we've got the susquehanna river which is now starting to 
pump some off-colored water into the system and um you know it, it's it's kind of holding some fish back i think what's going to happen and we have these stable sunny conditions except for tomorrow a little bit of rain but we're for the next five or six seven days i think we're going to see another nice wave of spawners really start to take hold and it may be the last wave that we see in our part of the country so um but yeah rain rain and muddy water and all that kind of stuff that can really hamper your fishing this Here, time here's a here's a pre-spawn fish from yesterday pre-spawn pre-spawn man Dude, look at i that. didn't drop the eggs yet nice and guess what you want to know what the constant was between this fish and the last big one i caught around you the camera was off <laughs> <laughs> i'm fighting this fish brian's in the front of the boat smashing buttons on the gopro taking pictures trying to get the camera turned on yep but uh yeah it ate a uh, ate a little spinnerbait a little mullock spinnerbait okay nice yep. you were fishing a little north of here i imagine nope no, still nope. pre-spawn around here. Pre-spawn down here. Yep. How about that? We'll, we'll trespass in action here in South Jersey. Yeah. <laughs> so, I, I was telling John, man, if, if you're trying to get, get on the, the juice around holes, here, trespass. you're, you're <laughs> trespassing somewhere. Yeah, if you ain't trespassing, you ain't trying. <laughs> <laughs> you ask for forgiveness, right? not permission. Yeah, sure. <laughs> this, the, these uh, opinions are not necessarily those of the Bash <laughs> University. <laughs> <laughs> Knock yeah, on the that, door and ask right. permission. Pete, guys Pete, Pete, Pete knocks on tonight. doors. <laughs> Any trespassing. Communication. Haven't we learned anything? <laughs> <laughs> Crying out loud. Sorry. You're going to get everybody arrested. All right. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> but um, no, it's a, is there any other IM questions you want to share with us, E? Yes. No, not particularly. <laughs> no, right. no, no, they're all addresses. Okay. <laughs> hey, well, I appreciate all the great questions and appreciate all those that came over and joined us at Bashu TV. Uh, Brian, do we have anything else on the agenda tonight? Uh, I don't know, Pete. You got the. I, I think we covered it, man. We yeah. yeah, let's lock it down. Did we give away John's screen? Mm -hmm. Yeah, one of them got it. All right. Yeah. Yep. Sweet. I am. We got the B B knocker. Knocker B. Knocker B. <laughs> we got the Knocker Bs coming away, coming at you that we had to buy um, from Yeah, <laughs> We had to buy. But, um, but now we're glad to do that. We're glad for all of you guys that participated in the show. Uh, come over and join Bashu TV. Check it out. Um, yeah, thanks, some... We Go. Thanks, Popticals. Right. Thanks, Lucky Tackle Box. Cash and Rods. Cash and Rods. Thank yes. you so much. Uh, we're going to be doing a lot of filming with Cash and Rods. Give them a try. You're going to love them. Um, they're made in America. They have the best warranty in the business. If you break it, if you have any trouble with it, you can just send it back and, and uh, with Rob replacement fee. And send Pete will pay one. for it. No questions asked. Um, thanks, everybody. Thank you yeah, for making the for trip up me. here, my I friend. Enjoyed it. Enjoyed it. Look forward yeah. to going and uh, learning a thing or two about the, the upper bay. And well, we'll uh, we'll see if Bud can keep the camera on when the fish are biting. <laughs> <laughs> and, and I think we gave away a couple uh, jerk baits tonight too, right, John? Yep, uh, absolutely. What what, what what's that? What bait is it? It's a six inch Provoke one hundred six. Oh, that is a six inch jerk bait. Give away a couple of those too. Yep, yep. yep. Outstanding here. Cool. Outstanding. And we'll give away a couple packs of potatoes too. Not not that one. <laughs> I'm, I'm trying them. Yeah, right. Uh, no, nothing leaves nothing leaves this studio. Uh. But hey, thanks E, thanks BTC, Bud. Thanks Good for boy, coming bud. down. Look bud. forward to working with you tomorrow, and we will see all you guys right back here on the next edition of Bass University Live. Thanks everybody. <laughs>